Hello, son and daughter. Today I'll dish out the realest, most fine, tingling horror stories straight from the horse's mouth. I'll be regaling y'all with accounts of cryptid confrontations and paranormal phenomena that'll rattle your bones. So don't forget to press that subscribe button and let's stir up some frights right here on the old Texas podcast. The initial discovery was a chilling one. I stumbled upon the remains of a bison, its carcass grotesquely mutilated deep within the wilderness of Yellowstone National Park. I'm Samuel Sam Harper, a seasoned park ranger with a reputation for my intimate knowledge of the park's diverse fauna. Over my years of service, I've witnessed the circle of life and death in all its raw and savage forms. But this, this was an aberration, a gruesome scene that seemed to herald a sinister new presence. The poor creature had been mercilessly ripped apart, its flesh torn from the bone with a ruthless ferocity that suggested a predator of colossal strength and chilling savagery. The nature of the wounds were inconsistent with any species native to this ecosystem. It was clear that an unknown beast now lurked in the park, a creature far deadlier than anything I had ever encountered. My quest to unravel this mystery commenced on a frigid, fog-shrouded morning, as the first light of dawn seeped through the dense canopy, casting distorted shadows over the undulating landscape. I ventured further into the park's wild heartlands. These were territories untouched by human influence, where nature existed in its most primal and untamed state. My days were fraught with peril. I battled hostile weather conditions, navigated treacherous terrain, and weathered tense encounters with the park's diverse wildlife. The isolation was all-consuming, a relentless adversary gnawing at the edges of my resolve. It didn't take long for my diligent search to yield a disturbing revelation. Evidence pointed towards a rogue organization having introduced unknown predators into the park. These were not ordinary predators. They were cryptids akin to the legendary Sasquatch and crawlers, reputed for their size and raw power. My heart pounded in my chest as the implications of my discovery set in. This invasion wasn't merely a threat to the park's wildlife. It was an assault on the delicate balance of nature itself. The culmination of my harrowing journey occurred under a pitch-black sky, devoid of any celestial illumination. In a remote clearing, I came face to face with a monstrous beast responsible for the gruesome carnage. It was an intimidating spectacle, a hawking silhouette of sinew and fur, its eyes radiating an ominous glow in the oppressive darkness. To my horror, I realized I wasn't alone. Shadowy figures emerged, their cruel laughter echoing through the night, revealing themselves as the devious puppeteers orchestrating the chaos. Injured, outnumbered, but resolute, I battled with every ounce of my strength. Just when it seemed the beast would deliver its fatal strike, the hum of an engine pierced the night. A van materialized out of the darkness, and from it stepped stern-faced men dressed in somber black suits. They were government agents, their expressions unreadable as they incapacitated the beast with a stun gun. As I lay on the cold, unforgiving earth, gasping for air, I watched them haul the unconscious beast into the van. One of the agents turned towards me, his stoic face reflecting in the dim light. He revealed that they had already captured ten similar cryptids. Then, without further ado, they disappeared into the night, leaving me alone in the expansive wilderness. I was just hanging out with my friends in the alley by the Panaderia Mexican Bakery. We used the alley in the parking lot to skateboard and just hang around and talk. There were five of us and we saw this thing standing on top of the flea market across the parking lot. It looked like a large man but he had wings that were wider than a car. It was watching us, and it had very bright red eyes that looked like the tail lights of a car. 
It stood there making these chirping noises that we could clearly hear, even from across the parking lot. It stood there for about a minute watching us. It made us all feel like we were in danger and that it was after us. It then shot straight into the air and flew over us. The entire time it kept watching us as it flew over. My friend wanted to run, but we told him to stay still or it might chase us and it would lead it to where we lived. I silently prayed to La Virgin de Guadalupe for protection, and this thing kept flying away from us and headed off in the direction of the arch. It made us all very scared, and when we talked about it the next day, we felt that one of my friend's ex-girlfriends might have sent it after us. She practices braharia, and it just seems like something she would do. If it was meant to scare us, then it did what it was supposed to do, as all of us were scared out of our wits. New to hiking found this trail in Griffith Park, Los Angeles that I've been going to for months. I love that I rarely pass people. I'm a loner, so it's heaven for me. This trail is not overpacked, and this is Los Angeles, so that's unusual. On this evening, I did pass a couple who were talking to their little boy about the cat up in the hill. I come to the conclusion that they must be talking about coyotes. I see them all the time. I take a few steps in the direction I'm heading and look to the side of the mountain, and there I see the most famous mountain lion in Los Angeles, P-22. I am in awe of such a beautiful creature. I really can't believe what I'm seeing. I stand and watch him weave through the shrubs on side of mountains, so easily camouflaging with the mountain. At one point he turns and looks at me directly in the eyes, and this is when I snap back to reality and the fear runs through my body. I keep eye contact and wave my arms, as I've been told to do when one encounters a mountain lion. I see him disappear in the mountainside. I typically try to avoid other humans on the trail, but this time I wish to encounter someone else so bad. The trail was lonely as ever. I walked down the mountain so fast. Next day I called the park rangers who confirmed this way, in fact P-22 hanging out in his usual spot. They're tracking him, and so far, in the many years he's been living in this park, he has never been a danger to the public. Nevertheless, this is an experience I will never forget. Me and a friend decided to go look for some spots to set up for turkey hunting the next week. We were walking around the land next to the local game lands. We had permission and decided to check out the game lands as well. After a while of walking down deer trails and thick brush, we found a nice clearing on top of a hill and thought it might be a nice hour to set up. But there was a steep almost hole dug out of the center of the hill that was filled with brush and small trees. We thought this might be a good spot to sit and decided to get a closer look, so he went around it and I got a closer look for somewhere to sit with a good view when I noticed what looked like a femur, then another and another. Turns out this hole was filled with bones. I almost took off before I noticed the first thing not completely decomposed. It was a deer. Looking around a bit more, I noticed a lot more decomposing deer and several other animals along with deer skulls, but it didn't smell like anything. Around then, my friend came over and had seen similar on the other side. Even though we knew it wasn't human remains, we still get the F out of there. A pit of corpses is still a pit of corpses, human or not. Well, I found out later that day from my friend, the land we started out on that's just where the road kill cleaners dump everything. Still weird that it didn't stink from just a few feet away. It was a Sunday morning, the 3rd of December 2017. I was playing the back nine at Eagle Creek Golf Course alone. The air was heavy with wildfire smoke from the Eagle Creek fire in the Columbia River Gorge caused by fireworks. I was on the 13th hole bordering Bonnie Lure State Park in Clackamas County, Oregon. 
My drive hit a tall Douglas fir tree about 30 feet up dead center. It made a classic wood knock sound. I regularly look for lost golf balls and often take a look over the cliff to the right side of the green. As I stepped up to the edge, I heard a grunt and a loud wood knock followed by a loud howl. I could feel the vibration in my chest. It started with an ape-like uh, ooh sound and rose in pitch and volume. Immediately afterward, a pack of coyotes started howling. I ran back to my bag for my phone, but it was too late. Everything went silent. I did take some videos and still shots, but never saw anything. As I approached the 14th tee, three deer were flushed from down below onto the course. No other witnesses, unfortunately. I believe there was a group of Bigfoot seeking shelter from the fire. If you look on Google Maps, you will, will see how this would be a likely place to hide. My grandfather grew up in the small town of Sasakwa, Oklahoma. Rather, he grew up near it. He and his siblings and parents lived in a large log and concrete cabin deep in the woods. My grandfather's father had built this in the 1950s. As my grandfather has told me many times, this area is full of hauntings and cryptids. It's almost absurd just how many areas are known to be haunted to this day. I will focus on one particular tale he has told me as I feel it is the most cryptid-ish. When my grandfather was a teenager, he worked with a group of Seminole on a local construction site. One day they went out walking to a site and came to a house. On the front porch sat an elderly Seminole woman rocking back and forth in a rocking chair. My grandfather met her eyes and felt compelled to look away. Having fallen behind the rest of the group, he realized that they were all staring at the ground, avoiding the gaze of this woman. The chatter had fallen silent and remained so for nearly half an hour. When they arrived at the site, he went up to the site manager and asked why they had all ignored the elderly woman. The site manager's face scrunched up and he stood. He locked the door, then spoke quietly. He explained to my grandfather that the woman was known to be a stakini. Now, my grandfather himself made sure that the doors to the house were locked when he explained the stikini to me. They are witches of the Seminole tribe. When the moon is full, they go out into the woods and vomit their organs up, stringing them in the trees to keep them clean. They no longer seem human, but appear as four feet tall owl's creatures with no weight to their body. They then go out and attack as they please, so long as the full moon dominates the sky. The stikini cannot be killed in this form. You must instead destroy their organs. My grandfather never again saw the woman, making an effort to avoid the route that passed by her house. Whether she was truly a stikini or not is unclear, as she has presumably died since the incident. After I was told this story, I made sure to lock the doors. Even now that I'm in a different state, I make effort to not speak that word in public and to always keep doors and windows locked at night. If anyone has heard other stories of these Taikini or have seen them, I would be interested in hearing it. I was driving alone in a national park, very far from people, on a bright full moon night. Huge clear moon, the kind of moonlight you can read by. The road went straight along the bottom of a wide, flat, mostly barren valley, then banked up and sharply left onto the ridge. It was about 10 p.m., and I drove through the valley on full alert, watching for animals and loving the scenery in the crazy bright moonlight. When I hit the curve and went into that sharp uphill left, I saw something through my side window, white thing. It was rapidly getting larger in my peripheral vision, as though it had been moving parallel to me, but the turn in the road meant I was now in its path. So I turned my head and looked directly. It was white, man, shaped but without genitals and naked, a deathly nauseating white with a greasy shine, completely hairless. It was crawling on its hands and knees, but it was half the size of the car, and it was coming so very, very fast. 
It had a rubbery face, distorted by hate or a scream. Black eyes that reflected the moonlight. The look on its face I can't even tell you. I can still make myself feel sick from the memory. I believe that it was intelligent and that it wanted to tear me apart with its teeth. The speed was horrifying. It went from being a small white spot to spitting distance in the time it took to make that turn. When I unfroze myself and hit the gas, it was on the road and I braced for it to run into my car door, and then it was gone. The rearview mirror showed me nothing. I have never told anybody. I have seen a few minor glitchy ghosty things over my many years, but nothing has ever frightened me like that. It was looking at me, and I don't know what it was. I can't seem to find any reference to anything like it, and I would like to know if this thing is known to folklore. If another subreddit would be better to ask, just say, thanks. Edit, thank you all for the replies so far. I looked into the Skinwalker and Wendigo ideas, and it's a case of almost, but not quite, are Skinwalkers ever seen without skins, then maybe. Can Wendigos be stocky instead of skinny? Then maybe. I am most intrigued by the Massachusetts story. Also, while I describe it as screaming, that's just the look on its face. I heard nothing. This happened in Newfoundland. Newfoundlanders have no trouble telling ghost stories, and a lot of them believe in fairies, but I've not heard of a creature like this. As for the bear idea, Newfoundland has only black bears. Hell, I even tried to tell myself it was a badly lost wet polar bear. But when I say the thing was crawling, I mean I could see its legs below the knee. I was very close to it by the end, and it looked like a crawling man. I spent a lot of time in that area and encouraged storytelling in the bar, but nothing like this ever got mentioned. But as I said, I never told this story either. The degree of fear involved somehow put it in its own category as if it would be very, very bad luck to speak of it, because it had seen me too. I never thought I believed in them, but I think it was a demon. When I was 11 years old, I went camping with my dad and my stepmom in a small town in West Virginia called Barnum. The park we went camping in was called the Barnum Whitewater area. Anyways, there wasn't a place to shower, and the bathrooms were just a hole in the ground, and there aren't words to describe how vile they were. Our cabin was nice and cozy, and was maybe 20 feet away from the river. One night, we decided to leave the campground to grab some food, because we had almost no food. So we went to get some food. It was really good law. But anyways, we went back to the campground around 9.30.10 and decided to drive around. Well, about one-fourth of the way around, there is Essa girl randomly standing on the side of the road with what looked like a torch. We pulled up to ask her if she was oak, and she froze. We thought she was drunk and drove off. As we came back around, about seven or eight dun buggies come around the corner, and you're not allowed to have those in that campground. We were like whatever and went to the cabin. We saw that the screen to the window was pried open like someone tried to break into our cabin. We were debating on leaving and going back to where we live, New Jersey. When a guy comes up to us with that same girl we saw in the woods, he asked if we knew her because she was scaring him and his two kids. He said she tried to tear open the tent. We said no, and he walked off and the girl followed. We decided to get the hell out of there, and while we were packing inside, she comes up the driveway and sits down on the porch, and we tell her to get the hell off of the porch, and she starts crying and runs away. The final time we saw her, she came up the driveway and started calling my stepmom, her mom and my dad, her dad, and we had not a damn clue who the hell this girl was. I can't really remember much about her, but I know she was blonde and she was pretty tall. And finally we left. Now we called the police, but they said they couldn't help us for two reasons. One, we had already left, and two, the cops are not active after midnight. What if someone's being attacked or threatened with a gun and is about to die or something? 
We were in shock, so we went back and drove the freaking four hours back to New Jersey, where we live, and we didn't get home until like 4 a.m. The weekend started like any other. No plans, just the anticipation of relaxation. But that all changed when my friends barged into my home on Friday morning announcing a spontaneous trip to Udi, Tamil Nadu. At first I hesitated, but their infectious excitement won me over, and I agreed to tag along. We were a group of five traveling in a rented car. It wasn't until we were on the road that we realized we hadn't booked a hotel in Udi, frantically searching online. We discovered that every hotel was fully booked due to the long weekend. Undeterred, we continued our journey, hoping to find accommodation upon arrival. As we reached Udi in the late evening, I stumbled upon a hotel called I India Hotel, located on the outskirts of the city. It had great reviews, and the pictures looked promising. Desperate for a place to stay, I called the contact number listed on Google Maps, but the call wouldn't connect. Then, in a stroke of luck, I found another contact number in a recently uploaded photo. The man who answered confirmed that they had rooms available at a reasonable rate. However, he insisted that we pay a 50% advance to secure our reservation. Suspicious, we decided to visit the hotel in person before handing over any money. Upon arrival, we found the hotel nestled in a quiet wooded area, away from any other buildings. It was an eerie, isolated spot. My friend and I got out of the car to investigate, while the others waited near the entrance. The hotel's exterior was well lit, but there was no sign of life inside. We called out, but our voices were met with silence. A creeping sense of unease settled over us as we peered through the windows, noting the tastefully decorated interior. Suddenly we felt as if we were the only people around, and that staying there would be extremely dangerous. We tried calling our friends in the car, but the connection failed. With adrenaline pumping through our veins, we made a split-second decision to leave and sprinted back to the car. As we sped away, we were plagued with questions. Who was the man on the phone? Why had he uploaded the contact information at that exact moment? Why was the hotel empty when the rest of the town was packed? And why were the lights on if the place was closed? The next day, we met a park ranger named Emily who worked in the area. Intrigued by our story, she told us that there had been a series of scams targeting tourists in the region. People would pose as hotel staff and try to collect advance payments for non-existent reservation. The hotel we'd visited had been closed for renovations, and the owners were unaware of the scam. I always felt safe and secure. I was 16 and had just started dating my future husband, Tom. One night, we were hanging out with his best friend, Matt, in the parking lot of a local park. We were just chatting and laughing when we noticed a huge tow truck parked on the main road. It seemed odd, but we shrugged it off and continued our conversation. After about 20 minutes, it was time for me to head home. I said my goodbyes and got into my tiny car. As I drove past the tow truck, it started up and began following me. At first, I thought I was just being paranoid, but the feeling persisted as I drove ten miles south to my neighborhood. When I turned into my neighborhood and the tow truck followed, my heart raced. Not wanting the driver to know where I lived, I stopped my car near the entrance, just off the main road. The tow truck stopped behind me, and I held my breath as a man emerged and walked toward my car. With my heart pounding, I tried to make sense of the situation as he approached. When he was about 15 feet away, he casually said, Get out of the car. No, I shouted, and without hesitation, I sped away. I drove around the neighborhood for 15 minutes trying to calm down. I called Tom, who tried to convince me to report the incident to the police. I was too afraid that my mom would ground me, so I never did. The next day, Tom and I went back to the park to see if the tow truck was still there. 
Instead, we encountered a park ranger named Rob. We explained our encounter with the tow truck driver, and Rob's face grew serious. He told us that there had been reports of an unknown predator stalking the area, possibly looking for vulnerable teenagers. Rob urged us to report the incident to the police and promised to keep an eye out for the tow truck. I finally agreed, and we filed a report together. The police never found the tow truck driver, but I often wonder what could have happened if I had been so quick to react that night. One one. One one. One one. One one. My wife and two kids went for a short day bushwalk hike at a place called Hanging Rock in Victoria, Australia. It's about one hour northwest of Melbourne. You can see what it looks like and get the trail info from generic hiking map page. It's a fairly short walk, only takes about an hour, but we allowed for a couple hours because we wanted to walk around the bottom and of course with kids we usually like to stop for some snacks and uh, drinks on the way up and just enjoy the place. We had not done this walk before because we are not from the area, but we are somewhat of a walking or hiking family. My wife's family are German, and it's basically in their blood, and is a favorite thing for all of them to do. I fall into that very well, as I have always been an avid walker and hiker, too. Because the weather was mild, and it was the last day of the long Easter weekend, there were surprisingly not so many people. A couple walked past us on the way down, and we saw another group heading up ahead of us. It looked like a family group, but their kids were older. There were also some people having a BBQ picnic and some others kicking a ball around down the bottom. Before we go up, I quickly went behind a tree and did a piss making sure to not be seen. We headed up and I personally started to feel strange. I am a big guy, but I am very fit cardio-wise and I started feeling out of breath. I thought I must have just had too big a breakfast or something, and so I slowed down and told the wifey and kids to slow down, too. We all eased up, and my wife asked if I was okay. The kids both seemed fine laughing. My boy was throwing sticks and rocks, and generally they were just being kids. The uneasiness did not stop. I honestly started feeling really out of breath, and as if I was being suffocated and could not breathe. I started freaking out a little, if I am honest at this stage, and began wondering if I was having some sort of heart attack or something, so I told my kids to hold up. I squatted down on the ground and leaned up against a boulder. My wife started to look really concerned, and she grabbed my daughter's fitness tracker watch and put it on my wrist. My heart rate was high, about 130, one beats per minute, but that was normal as we were going up these steps. Here is where things started to get creepy. As we waited around a bit for me to feel better, my son was now climbing all over the boulders and jumping off them. My daughter put her watch back on, but it stopped reading properly, and she noticed this straight away. It's a brand new kid's Fitbit that she got for her birthday in February. The time was right bit. It was not reading steps or heart rate. Okay, weird. It just read my heart rate fine, but was not taking hers, and the step counter was not working. Whatever, she tinkered with it for a moment while standing, and then bizarrely I started to feel better and come good, and so we all started off again. We continued up, and as we headed up, we got to a rocky clearing where you could look outward. You could see some farmland, and uh, generally it was beautiful. My wife was the only one that brought her phone. I left mine in the car, and she wanted to take a picture of us all. Here is where it gets creepier. Her phone was off. She never turns her phone off ever, and it too is fairly new. It's a uh... Sony Xperia, and is about a year or two old. Her charge lasts days if she's not watching YouTube. She tried to turn it back on and the low battery image appeared. How is it low battery when she keeps her phone charging at night while she sleeps? And we left for our trip first thing in the morning. And my wife never uses her phone in the car because she becomes motion sick. Otherwise, but also I used my phone to navigate us there. Weird. The kids go ahead. My son is running around like a lunatic, and my daughter is just walking and taking it all in. 
and I ask my wife if she thinks it's weird. Her phone is playing up, and so is our daughter's Fitbit. She shrugs it off and does not even say anything. We slowly get to the top, and as we get there, my son, who is six and full of beans, he's been jumping around, throwing things and doing cartwheels the whole time. He starts telling us it. Timmy feels funny. He is now gone pale and looks like he is about to vomit. We asked if he needed a number one or two. No, nothing. He just feels sick, he says. My wife, daughter, and I all look at each other, and I think we were all thinking the same thing. But no one said anything. We all just starts walking back out and want to get out of there. Too many weird and creepy things are now happening that don't make sense, and now my son feels sick when he was bouncing off the walks 30 seconds ago. We start walking back. My son is now deflated. My daughter is asking questions. My wife isn't saying anything. We all just hurry down once we get back. Down, we walk past the oval and go straight to the toilets. I take my son in. He tries to pee and doesn't need a no two, but also does not feel much better and we're just kind of sitting there thinking about what we do next. Do we leave? He feels sick. What if he throws up? Do we just chill there, go for another short walk, and hope he feels better? Then my daughter just wanders off to this information board while my wife and I were talking about what to do, so we all kind of just follow her. There is a sign about the sacred aboriginal volcanic rock formations, which I had not paid any attention to earlier, the signs that is, and I start to get an unsettling feeling similar in a way to what I had on the way up, that choky out-of-breath feeling. My son was chucking rocks at those things, the sacred rocks. He was running up and kicking himself off them. Pretty sure my wife even told him off for spitting once or twice. I became aware of it all and realized we were on some kind of sacred land, and here is my son acting completely disrespectful. I had taken a piss there and who knows what other dumb crap we had done. Maybe it all had an effect. I walk over, tell my son he needs to apologize and make an offering of goodwill, and so do I. He doesn't really understand what I am saying, so I just say come with me as I go to head back toward the path. For the way back to the start of the summit, and he starts screaming and shouting. I've never seen him do anything like this. Outside of being energetic, he is not at all a sucky or crybaby of a child. My wife comes over, asks what's going on, etc. My daughter is still by the info board, just milling about looking at things. I tell my wife my crazy idea. She gives me that look as if I'm insane, picks our boy up, and begins to walk away. So I walk back on my own. I find some similar-looking volcanic rock before the summit even starts, and I just go quiet and whisper. I'm sorry if we acted rude or misbehaved. This is a beautiful place. We'll be respectful. I'm sorry if my son was disrespectful. Thank you for having us, and I kneel. Down, touch the ground and the rock, and just sit for a moment in silence. I start walking back, and I notice they're all heading back towards where I am. My son is now walking again. He comes over to me looking like he has some more color in his fact, and I ask him if he wants to say something to the rock like I just did, and that it's fine, and he says, Hi, Rocky Rock. Rocks or something like that, and I say, No, mate, we need to be respectful, and I tell him to say sorry, say thanks, and say something nice in his own words, and he says, R.A. Rock for throwing your rock friends around. See you next time, Rocky Rock. Rock. My wife kind of laughs and shakes her head. My daughter starts explaining to her brother what we just did, why it's important, and we kind of stand around in silence for a second, and then I'll go back and pile in the car and start to head out and go find somewhere for lunch. We get home later that evening after having a long lunch and walking around a nearby town called Wooden and the kids playing at the playground. Both my son and daughter have had night terrors since they were about three years old. My daughter has mostly grown out of them, and my son still gets them, and I am talking. They are not nice at all.
We used to think my daughter was friggin' possessed when she would get them. She'd get aggressive, is in spit and cry and screech. They were horrible. My son, he basically just freaks out and starts screaming and looking absolutely terrified and wanting to jump off his bed, usually. Well, here's the strangest thing. We are all asleep. That same night, after having been on the walk that day, I sort of just jolt awake in the dark because I sense something or hear something. I don't know why I woke up. I kind of put my head up from my pillow and look around and I see a dark silhouette standing next to my wife. I friggin' absolutely shit bricks. I scream like a girl. What the if? Uh, my wife wakes up screeches loudly. It's our son. He's just stood there kind of grinning and he says something to my wife. She starts asking him questions. What is it? Are you okay? Do you need to go to the toilet? He's just grinning in between talking mumbo jumbo jim like gibberish we realize his eyes are glazed over and he is still asleep and so she takes him back to his bed he's never done this before and with everything else that happened that day we were a little freaked out looked at each other and just we to bed without saying anything else finally the last part of all this the next day at breakfast is we're all kind of doing our thing getting ready before school and work. My wife says to me that it's really weird she realized her phone, which was always on 24-hour time mode, because she is German, and that's just how she had always had it now, is in standard 12-hour time. Mode. This is the same phone that went off on our hike. She says she swears she never changed it. And she can't remember if his was 24-hour time when she first turned it back on the day before. Or just now this morning, I know for a fact all our clocks and watches that my wife touches and sets are always on. 24-hour time. She even speaks that way and will say it's 17 instead of 5 p.m. <laughs> I live in a very rural part of northern New Jersey in Sussex County. Behind my property and to the left of my house is all forest. There are a few trails. Next door to me is a protected wilderness area where you can't build on it. Every once in a while I would take my son in his little wagon and would set up on the clearing and have a little picnic. We were playing a few feet up before you go into the woods. So we're playing on the little clearing, and he starts to mimic the sounds that he hears. For instance, the neighbor's dog, birds, etc. He mimicked the sounds around us, like the squirrels running by and the chipmunks. All of a sudden, I turned around to get him some fruit salad, or whatever we were eating that day, and out of the corner of my eye, I see him just stop. He's saying, Mom, Mom, but he's staring away, not looking at me. He's looking into the tree, and he's pointing, but he's not blinking. I turned around. I asked, what do you see? Do you see a birdie? Then it hit me. There were no sounds. He starts walking into the woods, but the whole time he's looking up. He's still not looking where he's going and pointing up into the tree. The only movement I see besides my son are leaves rustling in the trees. Then I see it, and it's like heat rising up off the concrete on a sunny day. But it's in the tree, and it's like crouched down. One arm is out to the side, and its knees are bent. Immediately I feel this thing's glare burning into me. Then I hear the clicking sound. As soon as his eyes snapped to me, my son looked at me and freaking panicked. It literally had the shape of a humanoid. It's so hard to explain because it was humanoid like but the way it was crouched reminded me of a praying mantis. My son is then mimicking a clicking sound that this thing was making. I grab my son and we run back to the house. All the food and everything is left in the woods. I told my friend about what we experienced that evening. He went back into the woods and gathered my belongings. He stayed in the woods for about an hour, telling me later that he did not see or hear anything unusual. That was six months ago. It is now February 2023. I have read a few Glimmer Man reports from others online. When I go outside during the day, I occasionally hear those same clicking sounds coming from the wood. At night, 
While in bed, I hear the faint clicking sounds emanating from the deep woods. I believe that this glimmer man is stalking us. I ask my neighbors if they heard the strange clicking sounds. They have not. Maybe I'm only allowed to hear them. I will keep you updated. Okay, so I have this story that happened to me and my friends. To set the scene, we were on a Boy Scout camping shooting trip. There were 20 to 30 of us. We were in a little cabin thing with windows. On the front and back, in a front and back door, they were wooden tables all around the area. The adult cabin was about an eighth of a mile down a gravel road. In the dark, there was obviously a buddy system because it's Boy Scout. So it's around midnight, and everyone had been telling scary stories just like a normal camping trip. Well, I had to go to the bathroom and ask my friend to come along. He said sure, and he got our knives. We knew that there were bears in the woods, and it made us feel safer. Well, we went to the bathroom and began our walk back. This is where it got scary. I felt an instinctual fear. I looked to my friend, and he had the same look as me. We began to walk just a little bit faster and unfold our pocket knives. I then turn around and see it. It looked similar to a cat, but it was roughly six feet tall and was on its hind legs, and was on its hind legs kind of hunched over. I freaked the hell out and started running. My friend sees it too. When we sprint back to the cabin, it began making a moaning, howling noise and followed us very closely. We pound on the door, and the guys let us in. We tell them what we saw, and they actually believed us. So we locked the front door and looked at the back door. It had no lock. We pushed a table up against it and had a kid there with his knife for safety. We drew the blinds on all the windows that had them. One of them didn't, and we sat there with all the lights on. Then we see the eyes outside of the windows without blinds. We are all ourselves and the thing slowly walked to the back door. We heard it bumping up against it, maybe trying to open it. We think it then left, but we still thought we were going to die. No one slept that night, and when the adults came to wake us up, we told them, and they just laughed and said we were making it up. We know it happened even if they didn't believe us. My name is Jane Elizabeth Harrison, a devoted scholar of ancient cultures and a tireless seeker of obscured truths. The Pacific Northwest has always held a captivating allure for me. Its verdant forests, majestic mountains, and powerful rivers seem to carry whispers of ancient tales where the echoes of the past blend seamlessly with the rustle of the present. On a recent expedition, I stumbled upon a most intriguing discovery. It was a script not merely written, but etched into the very stone of a secluded cave. The ancient narrative it unveiled was a chilling tale steeped in the rich tapestry of the region's Native American history. The tale unfolded with a brutal battle waged between two formidable tribes, the victors a tribe renowned for their indomitable warrior spirit and keen tactical acumen, triumphed over their rivals. The vanquished tribe's settlement was ransacked, their possessions seized as trophies of conquest. Among the stolen treasures was a unique totem, an artifact of exquisite craftsmanship, imbued with an aura that seemed to hum with an unseen power. Elated by their victory, the triumphant tribe returned to their encampment. The stolen totem, their prized possession, their chief, a figure of formidable authority and unwavering courage, was particularly captivated by the totem. The script suggested it was said to house trapped spirits, but the chief, dismissing this as mere folklore, audaciously released the spirits within a spectacle to entertain his victorious warriors. The jubilant victory feast, however, quickly gave way to a mounting dread. Grotesque apparitions began to haunt the tribe, their once tranquil nights transformed into a theater of horrors. A creeping madness subtle at first began to sow discord among the tribe members. 
their once fearless chief, a paragon of strength and resolve, was tormented most of all. The spirits he had so recklessly unleashed had reduced him to a shadow of his former self. With a grim realization of his catastrophic mistake, the chief sought to rectify his error. Gathering a band of his bravest warriors, he embarked on a perilous journey back to the defeated tribe's territory. His intention was clear, to return the totem to its rightful place and make amends, hoping to placate the restless spirits and lift the curse that had plagued his people. The script, however, chronicled a tragic conclusion. Despite the chief's valiant efforts, he and his warriors never returned. His tribe, beset by the relentless hauntings and the insidious madness, gradually vanished. Their once bustling settlement was reduced to a desolate ghost town, a chilling testament to their fatal arrogance. As an archaeologist, this tale resonated deeply with me. It underscored the profound significance of respecting the traditions and beliefs of others. The tribe's downfall was a direct consequence of their haughty disregard for the sanctity of the totem. Their story, forever etched in stone, now serves as a dire warning to future generations, a poignant lesson in humility and respect. This story takes place about four months ago when I scoffed at the existence of mysterious creatures unknown to science. At night, I was investigating odd sounds I was hearing. I looked around the area and found large claw marks on a tree. I concluded that this was a prank until I heard an ear-piercing shriek. I looked up and suddenly a reptilian creature flew above me. I quickly ran after it, but it disappeared into the night sky. Ever since, I've been hunting this beast, hoping to catch it. It was about the size of a tall human. Any idea what this creature could be? What should I use to lure it in? So I've seen a good amount of strange and unexplainable things in my life, but the most recent one happened after I last moved across state. I was in the habit of taking late-night walks, and everybody who does the same usually has a story of something interesting that they've seen. But one night I was walking along a jogging path, on one side a bunch of housing areas, and on the other a large open field with woods on the other side from me. To give you a picture of this, there's short street lamps all along this path and a good ways ahead are a few house with the woods mentioned before running behind them, the woods being on my left side. The fence goes to them, then goes left, as does the path. When I was just about nearing them, I saw a creature start running towards the woods from the corner of the fence. From where I was, it looked like a hairless, tailless, small humanoid that ran on all fours. It ran similarly to how a monkey or chimpanzee would run. Now we have plenty of foxes in that area. It was roughly the size of one, and I was a good distance away from it, but when it got into the woods, I heard all sorts of twigs and branches snapping really loudly, something a fox wouldn't do. From what I saw, it was sort of a peach or paler skin tone. I wasn't scared, more of just confused as to what I had just witnessed. It happened last year, just before winter, and I haven't seen it since. This was in Missouri, if anybody is curious. I had recently divorced and decided to clear my head with a canoe camping trip. I planned to camp out for a few days and be picked up by my brother 12 miles downriver. This normally would have been an easy, leisurely trip, but my canoe should have been retired years ago. I drove out to my launch point, locked up my truck, unloaded the canoe, and took off, knowing I would hit some small rapids a couple miles downriver. When I did reach the rapids, my canoe started taking on water. Between trying to bail water and navigate the rapids, my canoe overturned and I was carried downstream. All I know is that shortly after overturning, I blacked out. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but when I came to, I, I felt something pulling on the shoulders of my life jacket. 
My vision was still blurry as I looked up into the face of a very hairy person. When I reached up to touch my head, it came back bloody and my ankle felt a stabbing pain with every jostle. The hairy person pulled me to shore and left me alone under a tree. I was scared not of this hairy person because it seemed clear that it meant me no harm, but because I was right in the middle of grizzly and cougar country badly injured with no way to protect myself. I started calling weakly for help, shivering and moaning in pain. It wasn't long before the hairy person appeared again carrying a spear-like branch and several others. I didn't have the strength to sit up, and my body felt like it was slipping into a warm slumber. I heard some loud splashes all around me, and a fragrant smell reminiscent of honey nut Cheerios came up around me. I also heard a sound near my head like that of a splat ball hitting the floor, and the strong odor that wafted toward me made it clear what they were doing. They were marking their territory. The warm fog of sleep finally overtook me, and I slept. When I woke up, the honey nut Cheerio smell was replaced with a strong ammonia odor. The fragrant territory marker by my head wasn't the only one. There were similar markers surrounding me as well near me. It was a small fire and a pile of wood, a pile of berries, and a crude clay bowl filled with water. Several hours must have passed because night had fallen and the forest behind me was dark. I was cared for, but alone. I felt battered and exhausted, but I knew that I needed to stay alert that night. I could hear movement in the forest behind me. A cougar appeared. It came closer, but it didn't try to get much closer than about ten yards. A bear appeared later, and it sniffed the air and turned away as well. The behavior of the wildlife made it clear that the territory markers were for my protection, and I made sure to stay within that area that night. I took short sleeping breaks throughout the night, trying to rest as much as I could. When I woke around dawn the next day, I saw my sleeping bag and backpack next to me. The sleeping bag was dry in the stuff sack, but my backpack was wet. I had some non-perishable foods and a first aid kit in there that were still good to use, and I got busy cleaning my wounds and eating a granola bar. I felt I had some of my strength back. I needed to ration my food before I tried to hike back out with my swollen purple ankle. As the sun rose higher in the sky, one of the hairy humans appeared and looked at the gear surrounding me. This time I was alert, and I took a close look at my caretaker. This one looked to be a male, and while it fit the description of what people called Bigfoot, I can't bring myself to call them by this name. These hairy humans were clearly intelligent, and to call them Bigfoot, the great North American ape, felt like an insult to this intelligent. His eyes settled on my knife, and he gestured toward it. I handed it to him, and he turned it over in his massive hands, looking at it closely. He stopped looking and handed the knife back to me, but I, I pushed it back toward him. I wanted him to have it, and considering the spear the other one had, I figured it, it would be useful to him. Out in the forest, the one with the spear returned and started speaking in quick, deep-sounding utterances to my caretaker. They locked eyes with me and pointed up river. I looked in that direction and pointed that way as well, and they grunted at me when I turned back to them. They were already striding back to the forest, and they were gone. I was sitting in the fragrant circle for a while, waiting to see if they would return. Then I heard voices coming from the river. Before I could gather the strength to stand, people in an inflatable raft came into view. I yelled for help. I yelled that I was hurt, pointing to my head and ankle. They quickly paddled to the shore. They loaded me into their raft, and I left my gear behind during the extraction trip. My rescuers asked me about what happened. I told them everything except for the hairy humans. It was crazy enough that they saw me sitting among territory piles. I uh, didn't want them to think I'd completely lost my mind. I know my experience was unique compared to what other people have experienced with these hairy humans. Maybe the group I encountered was a more advanced group of so-called Bigfoots. But to me, they will always be hairy humans. They rescued me from the river. They fed me. They kept me warm and... They even protected me in their strange way.
If that doesn't make them more human than beast, I don't know what will. I am a long haul driver and was traveling east on Interstate 8, just east of Fortuna, Arizona. This occurred in mid-June 2017. Having checked the clock, it was 3.45 a.m. when I alerted my partner to the presence of three or four individuals standing in the middle of the traffic lane. Three are sounding the truck horn. I began to slow our rig. Given the fact that the area is well known for human smuggling and is dangerous to travel, I wondered if perhaps we should keep going. But when it became apparent that at least three of the individuals were wearing some kind of uniform, I decided to stop along the right shoulder. Nevertheless, my second driver emerged from the sleeper with the shotgun that we carry. Both of us agreed that neither of us was going to step from the cab, and we kept the engine idling. Three individuals walked slowly toward me, toward the driver's side of the cab. At about 15 feet, I could tell that all three of them were suited, if you will, in some sort of gear. I wondered if the Marines from the nearby Marine Corps Air Station had crashed and were going to ask us for help. As I lowered the driver's window, the shortest of the three bundled in heavy white gear with what looked like white armor around the chest and a partial faceplate that emerged from below the chin, said to me in perfect English, Not to worry, we have a minor situation. He, uh, it, motioned with his left arm toward the distance off the highway. It was strange because neither my partner nor I saw anything as we approached the group, but sure enough, something was putting out intense red flames, maybe fifty feet off the right shoulder from where we were parked. Before I could say anything, a triangle-shaped wedge of the landscape to our right, with the flames at the base of the triangle, rose up and sliced through the truck cab. For lack of a better description, I felt like I was looking at some kind of image as it came through the cab. I mean, the individual who spoke to me appeared first on the left side near me and then appeared on the right side, the raised side, then on both sides, which appeared raised. My throat was so dry and my stomach was in knots. Honestly, I felt like I was going to throw up. I figured we had three individuals, two in white, wearing helmets and one who appeared burned or blackened and without a helmet appeared in the image to our right as they made their way around chunks of rock, walking towards our cab. There was a lot of communication, like radio, between them or between somebody. The one who had spoken to me after I had lowered the window now sounded metallic, so I turned once again towards the voice, to my left again, toward the open window, and he or it wasn't there. I turned toward my partner in the right front seat who was still cradling the shotgun, but nothing. I mean, it was black. It was perfectly silent. There were no flames off to the right in the distance. Our clock showed 5.15 a.m., and only the entire encounter felt like it had lasted 15 minutes or so. I don't know what to claim. I stopped to assist several entities that appeared to be projected from somewhere, and I still feel nauseous. I'm forwarding a summary of an experience that I and a friend had in August 2010. My friend and associate Kara and I traveled from Columbus, Ohio to Ravenswood, West Virginia on business. While we were there, I wanted to make a side trip to Gallipolis, Ohio, in order to visit relatives I had not seen for quite a while. After our meeting and presentation, we drove on to Ohio Route 7 and traveled south along the Ohio River towards Gallipolis. We had a nice, though brief, visit with my relatives. Around 6 p.m. we left their home and drove a few miles north on Route 7 to check into a hotel near the local airport. Around 7.30 p.m. we decided to get dinner and found a quiet restaurant so we could eat and work. After we finished, Kara needed to go to the store and pick up a few items that she forgot to pack. We headed to a wall, marked that was nearby the restaurant. After we finished shopping, we were walking to the car when I noticed a woman running through the parking lot. When she reached her car, she looked back in the direction of the store, 
then hurriedly got into the car. I quickly looked in the same direction and saw what looked like a large bird flying above the roof of the store. It was difficult to see, but when it swooped downward, the parking lot lights would shine off of it. It looked like it was either oily or had shiny leather-like skin. Whatever it was, it had a wide wingspan. I would guess it reached eight, ten foot across. It circled above the store for about a minute, then just disappeared. We were both somewhat shocked at what we witnessed, but figured that it was just a huge bird. Since it was dark, I figured we had misjudged what it really was. We drove back to the hotel and decided to call it a night so we could get an early start on the drive home in the morning. I got ready for bed, but thought I'd watch some television first. By this time, it was around 10 p.m. or so. I must have dozed off fairly quickly because the next thing I remember is frantic knocking on my door. I stumbled out of bed and checked who it was. It was Kira, and she was obviously upset. She rushed into my room and said, It's here. What are you talking about? A little bit perturbed that she woke me up. She said that she was laying on the bed reading when she heard something in the hallway. She got out of bed, walked to the door, and listened to what she thought was a scratching sound. After a few minutes, the sound stopped, so she went back to bed. Not long after she lay down, she heard more scratching sounds, but from outside her window. Again, she got up and peeked through the curtains. This time, something looked back at her. Our rooms were on the second floor in the back section of the hotel and both looked out onto a small parking lot and a large field beyond that. She could see what she described as a bald, ugly man with wings who was looking directly at her with large, bulging eyes that lit up bright red. It was there for only a few seconds. It then spread its wings while running at the same time towards the end of the parking lot and lifted off the ground like a bird. You're kidding, right? I muttered to her. Meg, I swear to God, that thing is out there and it knows we saw it. I knew the only way I was going to get some sleep was to allow Kira to stay in my room. The next morning, we woke early, checked out, and drove back to Columbus. Kara didn't mention the incident from the previous night during the ride. In fact, she has still never said anything else about it. We continue to be good friends and have a very good working relationship, but I got curious. I had never heard about the Mothman or any of the tales associated with it. I grew up in Texas and had only lived in Ohio for a few years. I moved into my mom's house after she had passed away. Her relatives lived throughout Ohio, but I had never been told any of the stories. This is the reason I'm writing to you. We were near Point Pleasant, W.V., when we had this encounter. Do you think that it is possible that this was a Mothman? I read some of your posts recently, and I'm starting to believe that Kira actually saw something supernatural in light of the prophecies of danger that this thing is supposed to warn people about. Kira has had some bad luck and tragedy since that day. Her husband suddenly left her. She had a fire in her house, and she severely injured her leg in a fall. Could this be connected? I personally don't believe in predictions, either good or bad. But I will admit that these have been strange times since we witnessed whatever... As an active duty United States Army soldier, I have to say that life in the barracks can be pretty interesting. You never really know what to expect, and sometimes you just have to roll with the punches. But one particular 24-hour duty shift stands out in my memory as both bizarre and utterly unforgettable. The day had started out like any other, and I was assigned to desk duty, answering phones, and attending to other administrative tasks. With just 17 minutes left in my shift, I was eager to wrap things up and finally get some rest. A few hours earlier, I had stepped outside to salt the stairs as it was snowing heavily. While I was out there, I had propped the door open with a heavy oak chair to make it easier for me to come and go. I should mention that my partner on this shift was away, conducting checks in another building. 
As I finished clearing the snow and salting the ground, I turned around to find the chair flipped upside down. It was an eerie sight, and I couldn't help but feel a shiver run down my spine. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone out there, but I decided to carry on with my duties, hoping that the ghost would leave me be if I didn't pay it any attention. When I was done, I found the chair had moved again, this time turned sideways. I addressed the apparent ghost, saying, Okay, Mr. Ghost, I don't want to bother you, but I have to go inside now. I walked back inside, taking the chair with me, determined not to let this strange encounter get the best of me. But things only got weirder from there. Upon returning to the desk, I found an empty trash can placed on top of it, a sight that wasn't there when I left. Feeling slightly unnerved, I spoke to the ghost once more. Look, Mr. Ghost, I get out of here soon. Can you please leave? Then, as if in response to my plea, a black shape darted down the hallway and I heard a whisper in my ear. Yes, at that moment, I couldn't help but freak out internally. All I could do was muster a shaky thank you before I hurriedly returned to watching Community on Netflix, hoping that the distraction would calm my nerves. The remaining 17 minutes of my shift couldn't have gone by more slowly. Every creak and shadow seemed to be magnified, making me constantly question whether my ghostly encounter was truly over. But when my relief finally arrived, I practically sprinted out of there, eager to put the entire ordeal behind me. Good morning, as I sit reading this article, it amazes me that no one caught one of these things yet. I understand that if something with a 25-30 feet wingspan flies past you, you're not going to grab your camera as a first instinct. My son and I saw this monster thing last summer in Mertztown, Pennsylvania. We were parked on the side of the road in a heavily wooded area when this thing casually glided up the road. It looked big enough to carry a full-grown man away with no effort. When the wing flew over the hood of my car, we instantly ducked down. This thing had a round, human-sized head with no beak, hence the term man, bird, and huge bat-like wings. Now, I would never tell this story if it wasn't for my 16-year-old son sitting in the back seat who also witnessed it on that summer day. I'm a pretty capable guy, and not too many things can shake me, but this thing scared the hell out of me. Here is what I saw. The body was five, six feet in length. Easy wingspan was 25, 30 feet easy, no feathers, bat-like skin, jet black, and a 4, 5 feet skinny, rat or dragon, like tail that stuck straight out. This thing didn't fly like a bird, it glided about 10 feet off the ground at a very slow speed. After 50, 75 feet of gliding, it took one huge flap of the wings, never changing elevation, and glided up the road till it disappeared into the woods. I'm convinced this thing lives underground, probably near some sort of hot spring, because it has no feathers. Well, that's my story. Feel free to reply with any questions that 45-second event will forever be etched into memory. I say we find it and catch it. I would love to see it again, up close. It was September 11, 2010, and my wife and I decided to go bow hunting on Wildcat Mountain, north of Estacada, Oregon. We followed an old logging road deep into the forest, enjoying the thrill of the hunt and the beauty of our surroundings. As we ventured further, we spotted an old log in the road that we had seen before, but this time, something was different. The bark had been torn off, and we found several enormous tracks around it that measured 22 by 10 inches. Intrigued, we decided to investigate the area thoroughly before returning to pick up a field research kit. After collecting the kit, we carefully plastered two of the tracks and examined the log more closely. That's when we noticed we weren't alone. A Bigfoot was watching us, and it seemed to be observing us from different angles. The realization sent a shiver down my spine, and I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and fear. 
As darkness began to envelop the forest, my wife and I decided it wouldn't be safe to stay any longer. With the plaster casts in hand, we hurried back to our vehicle and headed home, our minds racing with thoughts of our mysterious observer. The following morning, we returned to the site, hoping to find more evidence of the elusive creature. Unfortunately, a heavy rain had fallen overnight, washing away the remaining tracks and any other clues that might have been left behind. Even though our encounter with a Bigfoot was brief, it's an experience my wife and I will never forget. The memory of that day on Wildcat Mountain continues to fuel our fascination with the legendary creature and serves as a constant reminder of the mysteries that still lurk in the wild places of our world. It was Christmas 1993, and the holiday season had brought my family together for a festive feast. After indulging in a scrumptious dinner, I decided to take a ride with a couple of my young male relatives to enjoy the crisp winter air. Little did we know our peaceful drive would soon take a terrifying turn. As we drove along the quiet road, our headlights suddenly outlined a six-foot creature. It was busy tearing apart a rotted log, apparently searching for grubs. The creature's eyes did not reflect in the headlights, as is often reported in similar encounters. It was a bulky, flat-chested being with muddy and scraggly hair. I noticed no pointed head, but there might have been a crest on the apparent male's head. The creature turned and gave us an angry look that sent shivers down our spines. Just recounting the story at a meeting later made the hair on my arm stand erect. It stared at us for what felt like an eternity before finally taking forceful, strident steps away. It climbed a bench on the hill and disappeared into the timber, having been in view for about 15 seconds. We rushed home, our hearts pounding in our chest. I tried to reassure my nephews by telling them that what we had seen was just a bear. But deep down, I knew the truth. It wasn't a bear. It was something much more mysterious and terrifying. During a key in a session after recounting the story at a meeting, I shared more details about the creature. Its nose was somewhat human-like, and its facial features were strong and imposing. Its hands were large, with long, dark, and hairy fingers. The memory of that chilling encounter on Christmas night in 1993 has never faded. It remains a haunting reminder that there are still undiscovered mysteries lurking in the shadows of our world. I could still remember the chill that ran down my spine as our helicopter descended into the remote mountain range of the Pacific Northwest. We were an elite Navy SEAL team sent to investigate multiple high-profile disappearances that had captured the government's attention. The locals whispered about ancient legends of Bigfoot, Wendigo, and werewolves inhabiting the dense forests, but we dismissed these tales as mere folklore as we navigated the treacherous terrain. However, we soon realized that our skepticism had been misplaced. The evidence was undeniable. We found ourselves facing off against these terrifying cryptids. Each encounter left us breathless, adrenaline pumping through our veins as we fought for our lives against creatures we had previously believed to be mere myths. We were forced to adapt our tactics and weaponry to battle these legendary beasts while traversing the challenging landscape. Our state of the art military gear proved less than effective against these supernatural foes, and we relied on our wits and resourcefulness to survive. As we delved deeper into the mystery, we uncovered a clandestine organization hidden deep within the mountains. They had been capturing and experimenting on these cryptids, attempting to create an unstoppable army of monstrous hybrids. The horror of their intentions struck us to the core, and we knew we had to act quickly to stop them from unleashing these abominations upon the world. With grim determination, we fought our way through the heavily guarded facility, destroying equipment and liberating the tormented creatures, 
The cryptids, though fearsome, seemed to understand that we were there to help them, and they fought alongside us against their captors. In the end, we managed to capture the cryptids and cripple the organization's twisted plans. But the victory came at a terrible cost. Twenty of our brothers-in-arms fell in the line of duty, their lives lost to the formidable creatures they had been sent to investigate. As we left the Pacific Northwest, the weight of our losses hung heavily on our hearts. We had stopped a terrifying threat, but the world was now forever changed by the knowledge that these legendary beings were, indeed, real. We mourned for our fallen comrades, their sacrifices a testament to the strength and courage of those who dared to face the unknown. As we returned to our normal lives, the memory of our mission remained etched in our minds. We knew that the world was filled with more mysteries than we had ever imagined, and we carried the burden of our experiences with a newfound understanding of the darkness that lurked just beyond our comprehension. I lived in the Akatarawa Hills for a time. One night I was outside with my then partner in the yard, which backed onto some hills. I was using a flashlight to point out star constellations in the sky when I heard a rustling noise. When I heard it, I shone my flashlight where I heard the noise coming from, and to our amazement, we saw a figure about seven to eight feet tall with light creamy gray shaggy fur. It was upright on two legs and had its front paw's arms held upright, a bit like a kangaroo would. It had a face like a wolf, but I thought its snout was a bit longer. Its ears were like a wolf's too, and it had a longish tail, which was also covered in shaggy fur that curved up. The creature was sad on to us, so we couldn't see its eyes, teeth, or even see if the creature had seen us. It was walking quite slowly and disappeared into some trees. At that point, my partner went after it. He never found it, though. The sighting was approximately 30 feet away from me. I never saw it again, but to be honest, I didn't look too hard either as I was a bit freaked out. Last October, I was in California for roughly 11 days after my brother's wedding in San Diego. I just wanted to drive around the state and visit California places that had captured my imagination over the years. And I loved driving almost as much as I loved cars. I don't necessarily believe in Sasquatch, but I would never discount someone else's experience, especially if I wasn't there. So off I went. Clipper Mills is in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, about 70 miles northeast of Sacramento. Very near that dam was in the danger of failing last year, pretty remote. So after Bodega Bay, I had to cross the state for my destination, arriving near Sacramento in time for a late dinner. So it's after dark when I set out on the final leg, very dark. It takes me a good while on all the twisty turning roads to find my way there. I wanted to get to the exact spot the person who posted the video parked that night. He wouldn't say in his video, so I poked around YouTube comment sections and related videos and found out more or less about this spot. Around 11 p.m., I pulled my rented Camry well off the dark two-lane road to avoid any issues with the very sparse traffic. I saw no one whatsoever, so I sat in the darkened interior, listening, allowing my eyes to dark adept for about twenty minutes. I heard nothing but assorted insects as I sat there, saw nothing move at all. Eventually, not wanting to activate the car's interior lighting, I crawled out of the driver's side window into the black night, armed with my cell, with no service a handheld GPS to find my way back should I get lost in the dark in a red flashlight I use with my telescope. I stand there, right by that car window, for a solid two minutes before I could screw up the courage to move away from my Camry. Eventually, I walk up the road, still not hearing anything but bug. Suddenly, without conscious decision to do so, I fear right and head up into the woods. My feet are crunching pine needles now, and to my 
Mind, I sound like Bigfoot stomping around myself. After what was about 20 minutes, I stopped to listen and added to the insects. I hear this faint screeching sound far off in the blackness, and it doesn't sound insect like at all. It has more consciousness to it. Then, now also thoroughly dark adapted, my mind is whispering that it sounds like a person in distress or a large primate. I remain still. I hear something small scurrying around in the underbrush as well, followed a minute later by the same forlorn-sounding wail, but now closer, time to return to the car. As I'm walking back to the car, I hear this spooky sound every 20 to 30 seconds, and now it is coming from behind me and in front of me. It seems to have a vocabulary of some sort to me now. Different vocalizations, some guttural, some high-pitched, and everywhere in between. My mind is having fun just messing with me now. I was never so happy to see a camera in all my life. I started it up before my ass was in the seat. I think and half expected to see scores of red eyeballs glowing at me in the headlights from the dark forest in front of me. Now spooked, my mind telling me some homicidal axe-wielding lunatic was nipping at my heels. I went back the way I came at much quicker pace than I had arrived. Out of nowhere, right in front of me, this black lab runs out of the woods on one side of the road and into the woods on the other. I barely missed crushing him that scared the out of me right there. I slowed down a bit in the thought of nearly mowing down an innocent mutt overcoming my mind. Some hour down the road toward Sacramento is when I noticed I had cell service again. I opened my XPD app and found a nearby hotel for the night. Once safely enclosed in said hotel room, I began scouring the internet on my iPad and came to the conclusion that what I heard was a barred owl or a western screech owl. Can never be a hundred percent sure, I suppose. Very creepy, though. And I'm done with wandering alone in the woods at night, I think. Spring of 2020, early May. I was bear hunting in a new area and hiking up a trail. There had been some traffic from the week before that I could see. I had made it around a mile when I distinctly heard a little kid sobbing the word, Mom. I froze. It was barely first light, and there were no cars at the trail ahead. First thought was a cat or something worse. I read far too much of this crap. I thought about leaving, but also thought, what if a kid and his mom went out and something happened? I called out several times, but no response. Must have been an animal, I thought. I continued working my way up the trail, chuckling at myself and thinking about how paranoid I am. I hadn't made it fifty yards when I heard it again, but louder. Mom, I immediately started walking towards the sound and yelling that I was on my way and to wave their arms, because I can't see them. I stopped after maybe another fifty yards to listen. I hadn't heard anything back in response. It has to be a cat. I decide to wait and watch for a while. About thirty minutes go by and nothing. I'm thinking about how I need to get going and how stupid I am, following something around like that. Mom again. My blood ran cold. It was very close and it sounded just like a little kid. I yell again and slowly walk ahead. I put my back against a tree and listen. Maybe another half hour goes by. Then right above me, Mom, I dropped while pointing my rifle straight above me. I was shaking so bad. I can't see anything. I just keep looking, and then the slightest breeze comes through, and again, Mom. It was a small tree leaning into the tree I had leaned against. Every time the wind blew, it would make the sound. My name is Detective Sarah, and I've always prided myself on being a dedicated and resourceful investigator, but nothing could have prepared me for the case that would consume my life and lead me down a path I never thought possible. It began with a series of murders, each one more gruesome than the last. The victims shared a horrifying commonality. 
their bodies were found mutilated, bearing strange and enigmatic marks. It was as if they had fallen prey to something beyond human comprehension. I knew I had to delve deeper into this case to uncover the truth and bring justice to the fallen. As I delved into the dark underbelly of the investigation, a glimmer of understanding began to emerge. The evidence pointed me towards a hidden world, a world of cryptids, creatures that were believed to exist only in myths and legends. I found myself standing at the crossroads of reality and the supernatural, torn between skepticism and an insatiable curiosity. Determined to uncover the truth, I sought out the expertise of a renowned cryptozoologist. Driven by a shared goal of discovering the unknown, we formed an unlikely alliance. Together, we embarked on a journey that would lead us to the heart of darkness. Through tireless nights and endless research, we uncovered the shocking truth. A powerful and elusive creature lurked in the shadows responsible for the heinous killings. It was a being that had managed to evade capture and remained hidden from the prying eyes of the world. Armed with newfound knowledge and a relentless pursuit of justice, I led our final raid on the creature's lair. Every step was laced with tension and anticipation, our hearts pounding in our chests. The stakes were high, and the lives of countless innocents depended on our success. But as we confronted the creature, we quickly realized its cunning and viciousness. It fought with an intensity that left us breathless, its strength far surpassing our expectation. We fought valiantly, driven by the weight of our purpose, but it was a battle we could not win. In a split second of desperation, I found myself face to face with the creature. In that moment, I made a choice, an act of sacrifice meant to buy my partner precious seconds. I stepped between them and the creature, ready to make the ultimate sacrifice to ensure their escape. The creature struck with a ferocity that defied comprehension. Pain seared through my body as I fought to hold on, to buy just a few more moments. But in the end, the creature's power overwhelmed me. Darkness claimed me, and the world faded away. When I awoke, it was to the sound of grief and despair. My partner stood before me, their eyes filled with a devastating mix of sorrow and gratitude. They had survived, but at a tremendous cost, the cost of my life. As I lay there, my spirit broken, but my resolve unwavering, I knew that I had done what I had set out to do. I had uncovered the truth, exposed the hidden world, and given my partner the chance to continue the fight. In the end, justice prevailed, but it came at the price of my own existence. I left this world knowing that I had made a difference, that I had fought for those who could not fight for themselves. Though my physical form was gone, my spirit would forever linger, a reminder that the pursuit of justice often requires sacrifices beyond measure. And so Detective Sarah forever etched in the annals of those who dared to tread the line between reality and myth faded into the darkness, leaving behind a legacy of courage, determination, and an unyielding desire for truth. I had been a park ranger for nearly a decade, but I had never seen anything like this before. I was on my usual patrol route when I noticed strange tracks in the woods. They didn't match any known animal species, and they seemed to be leading to an area of the forest that was off-limits to the public. As I followed the tracks deeper into the woods, a sense of unease settled over me. Something didn't feel right. The forest was eerily silent, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After a few hours of following the tracks, I stumbled upon a clearing. In the center of the clearing was a small abandoned building that looked like it hadn't been used in years. As I approached the building, I heard strange noises coming from inside. I slowly pushed open the door, and what I saw inside sent shivers down my spine. There were strange machines and equipment that I had never seen before, and in the center of the room was a large metallic cylinder. As I approached the cylinder, I noticed that it was covered in strange symbols and markings. 
Suddenly, the cylinder began to glow, and I was knocked back by a powerful force. When I came to, I knew that something had gone terribly wrong. I could hear strange whispers in my mind, and I knew that I had been exposed to something that I couldn't fully comprehend. Over the next few days, I began to notice changes in myself. My senses were heightened, and I could sense things that I couldn't explain. And then one night, I saw it. It was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was humanoid in shape, but its skin was mottled in gray, and its eyes glowed with an otherworldly light. It had razor-sharp claws and teeth, and I, I knew that it was the source of the strange tracks in the wood. I tried to catch it, but it was too fast. It tackled me, and I went flying into the woods. I tried to get back on my feet, but I was dizzy and disoriented. I knew that I was in grave danger, but I couldn't bring myself to leave the woods. As the days passed, I began to piece together what had happened. The government had been conducting secret experiments in the woods, and I had stumbled upon one of their failed experiments. The creature that I had encountered was the result of their twisted experiments, and now it was loose in the woods. I knew that I had to stop it, but I also knew that I couldn't do it alone. I contacted the authorities, but they dismissed my claims as the ramblings of a madman. And so I remain in the woods, a lone ranger, battling a creature that shouldn't exist. I don't know how long I can hold out, but I do know that I won't give up until a creature is captured or destroyed. So hey guys, this is a long story, kind of. I've lived at my current house in North Carolina for about three years. When I first moved in, I had all kinds of weird encounters at night. I would be outside burning off tree limbs and things like that. I always felt like something was watching me. After the first few nights, I heard what sounded like someone calling for help, very muffled from the woods that surround my house. I shrugged it off. After a few times of that, I was walking the tree line and looking for more wood to throw on the fire. Keep in mind, this was about 1 to 2 a.m., and I had a 30-30 shell thrown at me. I don't own a 30-30, so I thought it was very weird. Anyway, this goes on for a few months until my ex came in and we brought our kids in the house to live. My ex had chickens and a pig that got out of their enclosure and were killed. She threw the carcasses into the woods. I know, I don't know why she did that either. But after that, all the spooky stuff stopped. No more eerie feelings, no noises, nothing. Now fast forward to last month. I've since gotten a new girlfriend, and she takes our dogs out in the early a.m., hours before she leaves for work. I leave the house at 4.15 a.m., so it's probably about 5.30 a.m. or so when she's out with him. Twice in the last two months she's seen what she described as something large and pale in the wood line. The first time was last month. It saw her and hurried off. This morning as she was walking the dogs, our large dog was barking like crazy and she saw this white creature again. She said it moved like it was scuttling, larger than a deer and on all fours, but almost like what a human looks like running on all fours. As soon as the dogs got a good look at it, they began trying to run back into the house. She and the dogs flew back inside, and she got ready to leave for work. She didn't see anything else so far, but I'm just wondering what's up. What could we do? What does it sound like? All the other encounters have had, and I never saw a physical form. Only noises and eerie feelings. According to her, this thing has moved closer to the house up the wood line. I'm just kind of lost. I doubt shooting at it would help. Any advice or theories would be welcome. I work in the Air Force as an aircraft mechanic, and like most jobs, there are boring second duties that we have to do now and then. For us, one of these is tool stores. We have a permanent civilian guy who runs tool stores in the day, but someone has to be in there to run it during night shift. The tool stores building is in the middle of the airfield and pretty far away from the other hangars, enough distance to feel pretty isolated. 
As a new guy, I was told that the tool store's building on our squadron was haunted. I thought it was the usual crap that people would tell the new guy, so I dismissed it. I'd done a fair few tool stores duty while I was new. You don't really have much use until you're trained up, so they stick you in tool stores and never had any issues. Eight months into my posting at this particular squadron, I find myself in tool stores again. We were night flying on this night in question, so nobody needed tools, which meant it definitely wasn't busy and I hadn't seen anyone in over an hour. It was getting on to about midnight, and usually we're trying to lock up by 1.30. However, when we're night flying, the aircraft don't land until midnight, and therefore we have to stay open longer in case they return broken. Suddenly I heard metal creaking. It's an old building with a ground floor and a first floor. The first floor is basically just metal staging, and you can see down to the ground from the first floor over a balcony-like structure. Although there are two floors, you can see pretty well upstairs from the ground, and vice versa. Metal creaking wasn't unusual. The temperature was dropping so it wasn't anything out of the ordinary, but not seeing or talking to anyone for a while just seemed to make it a lot more noticeable. Half an hour passed, and I heard what sounded like metal dropping onto metal. There are lots of metal shelves, however the floor was rubber-studded. Anything that dropped off the shelf wouldn't have made much noise unless it was sizable, and then it would be a dull thud. This was a distinct metal on metal sound. It creeped me out because I was in the office watching TV, and it was clearly audible above that, so it wasn't quiet. I reluctantly take a slow walk around and make sure nothing has fallen. Tool control is quite important, and if there's a tool missing, at the end of the night, everything grinds to a halt, and we have to search high and low until it's found. Nobody would be going home if we lost something. I decided it would be better to find something on the floor now than to wait until later and realize something wasn't where it should be. I strolled slowly, checking every tool making sure everything that wasn't there was tagged out correctly or had paperwork stating where it was. I saw nothing out of place. I had a look upstairs, although I knew the noise hadn't come from up there. Again, nothing. At this point, I find myself slightly on edge. The thought had played on my mind that it may have been some of the other guys winding me up. Usually, we told the tool store's ghost story to new people, and... Then when they found themselves on duty in tool stores, we used to mess around and silently come in through a little hatch in the back of the building. You guys didn't know it was there, so you could get in undetected and let the fun begin. I'd been on the squadron for a while, and by this point I was the one playing these jokes by now. It didn't make much sense for anyone to be playing them on me. I took a seat back in the office and continued watching crappy midnight TV, just praying. The jets would all come down serviceable so I could get out of there. No more than five minutes later, I hear footsteps. Finally, someone actually needs something, I thought. I went out to see what they wanted. No one was there. I checked outside the front door in case they were bringing something back and needed help unloading it from the van, but there was nothing there. I was losing my shit by this point. I turned around to head back inside and I saw wet footprints on the floor. It was wet outside, but my boots were dry since I hadn't been out all night until just now. Nobody was in tool stores when I walked to the door and nobody could have gotten past me to get inside while I was outside. I have never before believed in things being haunted or any kind of paranormal activity but if something was trying to convince me that I should be, they did a sure good job. I've had a few experiences. One in particular literally raised the hair in my neck and arms. I love going out to remote areas. I used to travel pretty deep into the mountains and stay in an off-grid cabin in Tennessee. When I was there, I never saw another human, and when I say drive, I needed four-wheel drive to get there. The road was more of a path than a road, and a rain destroy parts of it. 
The cabin had a small solar panel for a couple of small interior lights at night. It didn't support enough power to stay on, so I used candles and oil lamps when I was inside and moonlight was the best on nights that the sky was clear. I had an outhouse and always tried to be sure to visit it full the last time before it got too late. I had seen coyotes herd mountain lions in heat, which will creep you out on its own, and seen bear scat. With that much going on, I really tried to use the bathroom for the last time each night before full darkness hit. One night in particular, I had the unfortunate experience of a full-on angry abdomen IBS attack and desperately had to get to that outhouse at 11 p.m. or so. It was very dark and the sky was overcast. The trees blocked any minor moonlight coming through the clouds. I had an old flashlight I left there, and I guess humidity got to it. It went out halfway to the outhouse, which was about 25 feet from the cabin. I already felt stalked with the light on, but didn't see anything around me when the flashlight was on. I figured I was creeping myself out. Then the light went out halfway, and I felt so exposed. Again, I kept thinking I was just freaking myself out. I am not a person who freaks out easily or gets scared easily. I have been through a lot in life, so it was really odd to have the sense I was being stalked. I really, really had to get to the outhouse. My stomach was not happy. I rushed to the door, fully focused on getting some relief, and as I grabbed the handle in the dark, I heard dry branches on the ground crack as something stepped on them. I smelled the mist foul smell I have ever smelled. I have pulled dead, rotting possum corpses out from under homes and smelled some major nastiness in my life. This smell, this made the hair in my neck stand up. I really had to deal with my stomach. The stupid flashlight would not come back on. I finally had some relief from my stomach and no new sounds had occurred while I was in the outhouse. I waited and listened and I heard nothing. My plan was to go slowly and confidently to the cabin. I had no idea what I was dealing with, but I was convinced showing fear would only get me attacked and or dead if I was creeping myself out. As soon as I opened the outhouse door, that foul smell was there and stronger. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. It was pitch dark out. I counted my steps and kept moving toward the cabin and let my breathing calm and you feel like something was right behind me. The smell was so intense it made me feel sick. I just kept going. I was nearly to the house and I felt the back of my hair move like someone or something swatted at it. I finally rounded the corner of the cabin and climbed the stairs. I got inside that cabin as fast as possible. I was beyond scared. Every single hair on my arms and neck were standing up. I looked out the only window I had and could swear I saw orange eyes glowing in the dark staring back at me. I thought I was letting the fear and my being so tired play tricks on my eyes. I rubbed my eyes and looked again. They were still there. They were really, really high up. I thought is that something in a tree. It would have been seven or eight feet tall if it was standing. Trying to make sense of it, I convinced myself it was something in a tree. The next morning, I went for a walk and go in a huge and very weird three-toed footprint in some mud near the outhouse. To get to the deer stand I sit in, I have to walk through a small path in the woods from the drive I park on and then turn onto the field edge lining the woods. I walk the field probably 100 yards or so before I turn back into the woods and walk in probably 40 yards to the stand. As I turned onto the field, I hear steps just inside the woods. Definitely something with four legs. Pitch black, so turn on my headlamp and look. Don't see a thing, thinking my head is playing tricks on me. Start walking again, and whatever it is starts walking as well, step for step. Stop, look again. Nothing. This went on for about 50 yards, and then it stopped. I kept going to my stand, not looking back, but kept a hand on my sidearm. Was bow hunting at the time. Didn't hear it again. Sat all morning and saw nothing. Went in for some lunch, and it started snowing around that time. 
came back out around three, and as I start walking through the path to the field, I notice there are bear tracks along the path and then veer off into the woods. Not sure if it was the bear pacing me or what, but definitely made my walk out of my stand and easy that evening after dark. We do have some wolves in the area, but uh, they are a rare sight. That's always in the back of my mind. Just remembered this one. About 15 years ago, I was at a buddy's place, and he has a friend over. He starts telling me what a great bow hunter his friend is, and we start talking hunting. A few beers later, he tells us about a strange thing once that scared him so bad he ran off and left his bow and swore he'd never go back in there. Now my friend and I start giving him a hard time and he starts to get angry, telling us it was translucent and had glowing eyes and was about eight feet tall. He was obviously dead serious, and my friend and I, being normal guys, proceeded to make fun of him. About six months later, this guy died suddenly of a brain aneurysm he didn't know he had. Someone told me when people have a brain aneurysm, they sometimes hallucinate and see things that are totally real to them. We felt pretty bad after we found out. So this is a story my dad recently told me about my grandpa, his dad, and my great-grandpa, my grandpa grew up in very rural southern Indiana, but moved to very rural southern Illinois in his youth. So this takes place in Illinois. One night, grandpa and his dad were hanging out at his uncle's, who lived a couple of miles away. Keep in mind, this is the 40s out in the country, so all roads are just dirt, basically. Anyway, it was pretty late, so they decided to head home and hopped into their old car, going probably about 15 miles per hour through these woods roads. At some point, as they're just driving and talking, they pass something along the edge of the road, standing upright. They both hunted and were very familiar with any animals or other local people that may be around. Neither one of them really said anything for a minute. And then they both looked at each other and said, what the hell was that? My grandpa asked his dad, do you want to turn around? And he said no, and they kept driving. My grandpa said it resembled a big owl or small person just standing in the ditch. I was on a camping trip with my sixth grade class. The teacher, Steve Campbell, brought a group from our class up to the Williamson River for a trip to reward the students who had few or, or no disciplinary problems for the year. We drove up Highway 97 and about one, two miles past the Collier State Park, we turned onto a dirt road. We continued down it for a while, stopped and parked the trucks. We hiked up a trail with our backpacks for about one half miles. We came to the camp spot across the Williamson from a large rock face jutting from the hillside. We set up our tents about 100, 200 yards away from the river. Myself and two other guys were in one tent and the girls in the other. We were about asleep and contemplating scaring the girls when we noticed all of the bugs and animals around went dead silent followed by a terrible stench, like rotting flesh. Then came the breaking branches, footsteps, and grunts. I looked out the door of the tent to see if it was the girls harassing us. Flashlight pointed out. I looked, and to my horror, I saw three tall, dark figures with glowing yellow eyes. They were about nine feet tall, hairy, and hideous. I love gorillas, and I can tell you for a fact that it was no gorilla, they looked human in the face and in posture. When I looked into their eyes, I felt like death had come for me. I couldn't move, and I was cold all over. I dove back into the tent, and we heard them howl. It sounded like a mixture of a wolf crying and a woman screaming. A few minutes later, we heard and felt something hit the tent, as if they had thrown a tree branch at it. When we got up, the branches on trees around us were snapped, and there were branches littered around our campsite. Since then, I have completely avoided the Williamson River area. 
I do plan to go back, however, to try to capture them on film, sound recording, and hopefully find more evidence to support what I know I saw. When I was a young man, I often used to go out in the mountains over there, pointing out of the window in their direction, to fish for trout or to hunt. And it was in January on a cold, dry day, while carrying my gun that I had a friend with me. As we were walking around Ben Bulb and saw one of the gentry for the first time, I knew who it was, for I had heard the gentry described ever since I could remember. And this one was dressed in blue with a headdress adorned with what seemed to be frills. When he came up to us, he said to me in a sweet and silvery voice, The seldomer you come to this mountain, the better. A young lady here wants to take you away. Then he told us not to fire off our guns because the gentry dislike being disturbed by the noise. And he seemed to be like a soldier of the gentry on guard. As we were leaving the mountains, he told us not to look back, and we didn't. Another time, I was alone trout fishing in nearly the same region when I heard a voice say, It is barefooted in fishing. Then there came a whistle like music and a noise like the beating of a drum, and soon one of the gentry came and talked with me for half an hour. He said, Your mother will die in eleven months, and did not let her die, you know, ninety. As he was going away, he warned me, You must be in the house before sunset. Do not delay. Do not delay. They can do nothing to you until I get back in the castle. As I found out afterwards, he was going to take me, but hesitated because he did not want to leave my mother alone. After these warnings, I was always afraid to go to the mountains, but lately I have been told I could go if I took a friend with me. I was driving home to Ben near sunset, just south of La Pine on Highway 97 on November 5th, 1996, when a hawk was flushed from the tree line ahead on my right. It flapped vigorously, headed southward directly toward my car, crossed over it, and kept going. It was not gliding, it was accelerating. Seconds later, I saw a tall, rangy figure suddenly emerge from the cover of the tree line about 150 feet ahead on my right and stride determinedly toward the road across a grassy fringe. As I slowed and closed the distance to within 50 feet, the figure with no hesitation, stopping neither to look in the direction of my approaching car nor to gauge the speed and distance, glided across the two lanes in four strides and kept going directly into the cover of the pine. On the other side of the road, I asked my wife if she had seen the person crossing the road. I wanted her opinion of what had transpired before expressing my own suspicions. Unfortunately, she said no, that she had been trying to follow the flight of the hawk behind the car. On immediate reflection, I realized I had seen something unusual, but could not say what exactly I had seen. Nor can I say now what it was, but if it was a human being, it was a strange one. The figure seemed not just tall, but very tall. I would estimate close to six feet eight to seven feet tall, based the figure's height relative to roof of my car. The length of stride required to cross the road in just four strides would be quite large. Its actions did not seem typically human. It did not wait for its chance to cross at the roadside. It waited hidden in the tree line. When its chance came, it never slowed until hidden in the pines on the other side of the road. It didn't even turn toward me, though its efforts indicated it was aware of and concerned by our car's approach. It didn't run or jog as a human might who is caught crossing the road in front of an approaching car. Its step was a well-articulated, almost thoughtful, full heel to toe stride with a vigorous push-off. It moved briskly with a long swinging arc of the arms, a slightly stiff body lean with the head and trunk bent forward from the waist. The head was not bent at the neck. I saw no neck. The whole upper torso was bent from the waist. I have thought about the clothing. During the brief seconds I had seen the figure, the clothing appeared to be completely and uniformly dark, 
top to bottom, without distinguishing characteristics. I could not identify the articles of clothing. Jacket, jeans, boots, gloves, etc. With one exception, the one article of clothing that I might have noted was perhaps a peaked lumberjack's cap with a fuzzy tassel. On reflection, I wonder if it might instead have been the often reported pointed head or skull. I had been a park ranger for over a decade, and I thought I had seen it all. One day I was called to investigate a series of strange disappearances in a national park. At first I thought it was just a case of lost hikers or campers who had wandered off the beaten path. But as I dug deeper I realized that something far more evil was happening. The disappearances all seemed to be connected, with each victim vanishing without a trace in the same area of the park. But what was even more bizarre was that there was no sign of a struggle or any evidence of foul play. I knew that I had to follow every lead, no matter how small, if I was going to get to the bottom of this mystery. And as I dug deeper, I began to uncover a web of lies and deceit that went far beyond what I could have ever imagined. It all started when I stumbled upon a secret government facility hidden deep in the woods. At first I thought it was just a research station or a wildlife monitoring outpost, but as I got closer I realized that something far more dark was going on. The facility was involved in genetic experimentation, using animals from the park as test subjects. They were creating hybrid creatures, blending the DNA of different species in a twisted attempt to create the ultimate predator. I was horrified by what I saw, and I knew that I had to expose this atrocity to the world. But before I could do anything, I was ambushed by a group of armed men who whisked me away to an unknown location. For days I was held captive, interrogated, and threatened. They wanted to know everything I had discovered, and they made it clear that if I didn't keep quiet, I would suffer the same fate as the missing campers and hikers but I refused to be silenced. I knew that what they were doing was wrong, and I was determined to fight back. I failed. The next day, when a new park ranger arrived, he seemed completely unaware of the disappearances of the government facility in a last park ranger. It was as he had never existed, as if he had been erased from history. It was the time of our annual harvest festival in the village, a time when we came together to celebrate the bounty of the earth and the bonds of our community. Laughter filled the air, and the smell of delicious foods and the sounds of music and dance filled our hearts with joy. However, none of us could have anticipated the events that would soon unfold. During the height of the celebrations, an enigmatic stranger appeared in our midst. He was an odd figure, with a gleam in his eyes and an aura of mystery that captivated us all. Claiming to possess supernatural powers, he challenged the villagers to a game, promising to grant us extraordinary gifts if we could best him. Intrigued by the stranger's words, we eagerly accepted his challenge, unaware of the true nature of our opponent. As the game began, we soon discovered that the stranger was no ordinary man, but rather a cryptid known as the Trickster, a shape-shifting being that thrived on chaos and mischief. With each passing moment, the Trickster used his paranormal abilities to manipulate the villagers, turning us against one another and pushing our community to the brink of destruction. Friend turned against friend, and the bonds that had united us for generations began to unravel. In the midst of the chaos, our village's wise elder recognized the danger we were facing. She knew that the only way to save our community from ruin was to outwit the trickster and put an end to his malicious game. Drawing upon her knowledge of ancient lore and her own deep wisdom, she devised a plan to confront the cryptid and expose his true nature. The elder gathered the remaining villagers and shared her plan. We listened intently, understanding the gravity of the situation. In the importance of unity in the face of the trickster's deceptions, 
With renewed determination, we followed the elders' guidance and played the game, using our wits and our trust in one another to resist the trickster's manipulation. Despite our best efforts, however, the trickster's power was too great. He wiped out the majority of our people, leaving only a small group of us standing. Realizing that he could no longer deceive us or sow chaos among us, the cryptid fled, vanishing into the shadows from which he had emerged, never to be found again. In the aftermath of the devastation, those of us who remained came together to rebuild our village and heal the wounds of the past. We mourned the loss of our loved ones and vowed to honor their memories by preserving the lessons we had learned. The story of the trickster would be passed down through the generations, a cautionary tale of the dangers of hubris and the importance of unity in the face of adversity. And though our village would never be the same, we held on to the hope that together we could face whatever challenges the future might hold. I'm currently 30, but was about 17 at this time. I was at a friend's house, two brothers. For the second or third time, deep country, hung out into the evening and night. The older one in my grade randomly brings up some bright light that shines around that isolated area. I didn't think much of it, but they seemed to be down for a little night adventure. We decided to roll a blunt and go sit out in some pasture field. We sat around, talked, looked at the stars. I didn't even remember what they were talking about earlier. Suddenly, everything I could see lit up like day. For a fraction of a second, it was as if a digital camera three miles wide was hovering above us and just snapped a picture with the flash on. I remember seeing the hills in the distance, trees and cows here and there. It was over as soon as it started, and we all looked at each other, confused. Our expressions all lead to the same reaction, and all of us run. We sprinted through pastures and helped each other through barbed wire fences, just scared. According to the two brothers, this was not a rare occurrence in Milheim, Texas. We're not friends anymore, in case anyone wonders why I use that context. I don't have a single clue as to what this was, just that it happened freaked me out and blew my mind, had me feeling like a bacterium in a Petri dish for a moment. I've never heard of anything even somewhat related to this. It seems coincidental that I saw it the same day I was told about it, but that's how it happened. And no, I'm not talking about a spark or a light bulb. It was literally like clear daylight for about two, four seconds. Clear skies looking at the stars all night. No lightning or thunder. There was no sound to it. In the small town of Crossland, Kentucky, humble people live simple lives and farm and sell goods to the bigger neighboring Pierrier, Tennessee, and Murray, Kentucky, respectively. In the early 1960s, a man named Larry or stumbled upon the snake. Unlike anything common to the area, it was 65 feet long by length and 6 feet by width. And in his words, well, I had thought it was a moonshine still, until it hissed at me. A sketch of the beast was drawn by his nephew perfectly to his description. It was emerald green with irregular brown splotches on its back and underbelly. Branching off from other snake species, it had a row of human-like teeth and fangs where its insecores would be. Small spikes lined across its back and head and ended off with a crest between its eyes. As the story spread, journalists from around the United States flocked to get a glimpse of the creature that scared the residents of Crossland. Hunters and trackers also attempted to catch the creature to no avail. In 1977, an expert snake hunter finally caught the beast, but it was revealed as a fake as the snake was less than half the size and actually from a circus, which was in the area at the time. During the era of the snake, livestock and pets mysteriously disappeared with the only remaining evidence were bells, collars, and blood. 
The early 80s proved the end of the snake overturn as residents of Crossland, now part of Perrier, Tennessee, see part one, and their town have faded into obscurity. Before I end this off, this is 100% true. Crossland, Tennessee exists, and evidence of the snake hunt can be in many local newspapers from that time and region of the Tennessee's and Kentucky state line. As many wonder on and about the past terror of a monstrous snake, could it happen again in those deep, dense cornfields, the dark, dreary woods of the night, or the muddy, murky waters of the creeks and marshes? One thing is for sure, snake season is spring. As an ambitious archaeologist, I had always been captivated by the mysteries of the past, especially the stories of the long-lost Native American tribes. When I stumbled upon the ruins of one such tribe hidden deep within a dense forest, I knew I had made a monumental discovery. Among the artifacts I found was a set of ancient texts detailing their encounters with a mysterious and terrifying cryptid known as the Howling Wind. According to the texts, this creature was believed to control the weather and unleash devastating storm. I felt a mixture of excitement and trepidation as I continued my research, eager to unravel the secrets of this forgotten tribe. However, I could not foresee the consequences of my actions. By delving into the mysteries of the past, I had unknowingly unleashed the dormant spirits of the tribe's ancestors. Angered by the desecration of their sacred grounds, these spirits sought vengeance. In their quest for justice, the spirits summoned the howling wind to terrorize the nearby modern Native American community. Unrelenting storms ravaged the land, and the people were left in a state of fear and despair. Realizing the connection between my actions and the chaos that had befallen the community, I knew it was my responsibility to make amends. With the help of the community, we worked together to understand our ancestors' connection to the cryptid and find a way to bring peace to the land. We studied the ancient texts and discovered a possible solution. A gun filled with the poisonous blood of our ancestors, which was believed to have the power to defeat the howling wind, determined to end the suffering of the people. I ventured into the heart of the storm to confront the howling wind. The creature's fury was unlike anything I had ever experienced, but I held on to the hope that our ancestors' wisdom would guide us to victory. As the wind howled around me, I took aim and fired the gun the poisonous blood piercing the cryptid's ethereal form. The howling wind screams filled the air as its power began to wane and the storm finally subsided. The spirits of the ancestors, satisfied that their sacred grounds had been avenged, retreated into the realm of the past. With the chaos finally at an end, the community came together to rebuild and heal. We vowed to honor our ancestors by respecting the land and the ancient wisdom they had left behind. The story of the howling wind would live on as a reminder of the power of unity and the importance of understanding the past in order to protect our future. I never told this story to anybody but my daughter because I knew nobody would believe me. I don't even believe it. I worked at a video store back in the early 90s, and this couple came up to the counter to pay for their movies. They were talking, and the girl was saying, I know what I saw. It was a centaur. I was like, huh? Her friend said, you must have been drinking something or uh, on drugs. After they left, I was thinking the same thing. That girl was on something cause there's no such thing as a centaur. Fast forward a couple of months, me and my boyfriend were going to a racetrack about an hour away from our town. We were making small conversation, and I looked to the side of the road. The road we were on was known for deers, and I was looking out. As I continued to look, I saw a man on a horse, and as we got closer, it wasn't a man on a horse, he was a part of the horse. I turned to my boyfriend and asked him, did he see it? 
He didn't, and I was not going to tell him what I saw, because he didn't believe in that sort of thing. I wondered if this was what the girl in the video store saw. I just can't believe what I saw. A centaur that's made up, right? A long time ago, before photos were relevant in Alaska, my ancestors lived in harmony with the little people. Yes, their next-door neighbors and shit. They lived like that for a while until one day, one of the dogs of the native people ate one of the little people's baby, as it had stumbled too close to the dog. Food was scarce to try and keep every single dog pack well fed. The little people leader met with the native leader and suggested that they put down the dog and all would be forgiven. Mind you, this was the native's finest dog and was the leader for many years and he decided against it. Yes, I know it's kind of petty and I will never understand why he couldn't sacrifice one dog as great as he was and try and craft another leader to keep peace between the peoples. As you'd imagine, both sides split up, and it's been that way ever since. It does fascinate me how life would be so much different if the native leader complied with the deal. I do wonder how it would be to live with them time to time. Anyway, one winter night in cold-ass Alaska at around 5 a.m., I went outside to smoke a cigarette. It was unnervingly quiet and dark, as it usually is that time of night. I live in a really really, really small town that barely stretches across a mile long. Outside of my house, there is one LED light connected to an electric pole that's about a block or two away. There's never anyone out riding their machines or four-wheelers that time of night, and rarely ever is someone walking around, let alone running. I'm smoking my cigarette, and about halfway through, I saw it at the corner of my eye. At first, I thought it was someone taking a jog, but who would be jogging at 5 a.m. on a cold winter night? Not insulting my town, but no one runs here, lol. Not outside, at least. There are some white teachers who do run, but all the teachers were out of town, back with their families in their home state, as it was Christmas season. It was also snowing lightly. I turned to look and, oh... If this seven-foot mother F was just blasting down the street. I'm talking Usain Bolt shit going for that gold. I'm not really great at height perception, but I know he was at minimum six feet eight seven. But here's where it gets creepy. When you run, you move your arms right. It's just instinct, and I believe it does help you go faster with the right form. When I saw it, both arms were tucked on the side of his hips. No arms moving, but those legs were going at least 20, 25 miles per hour. I was surprised at this point, but then I noticed something else it was doing. It watched me as it ran by. I can see the parka rough outlines at the top of its body, facing towards me the whole time it was in sight. No arms moving, only legs, looking at me as it burned through the road. Now I did say there was a bright LED light a couple blocks away from my house and it faces towards my place, but that didn't do any help in trying to scope out its facial features, especially since the light was on the side as it was running and completely on the other side of its face as it was looking towards me. I watched it go by as it just watched me also. It felt like an eternity, but really it was only about a 10-15 second encounter. Right behind it, a fox was chasing him, almost like it was its pet or something. Although it's widely known in the state big and little people have supernatural powers, one of which is being able to transform into an animal it chooses. So I really don't know if that was its buddy or its pet. I'll never know. As soon as both of them were out of my sight, I went further onto the porch to see where they went. My friend, when I told him about that part, said, eh, what if it just turn around and run toward you when you do that? That made me realize how dumb I actually was trying to observe its whereabouts, and that I never in a million years would go further onto the porch just to see it again. After I saw it had gone, I couldn't fathom what I just saw until later. 
but I noped the F back inside. Even my cigarette was unfinished. I didn't even put it in the cigarette container. Just flew it across the yard LMAO. I went inside, continued on like it never even happened. Went to sleep and I wouldn't talk about it for another year or so. I have no idea why. But when I did finally tell my said friend mentioned above, he immediately said the native word we have for tall people. A lot of my people choose to doubt me whenever I tell them about it, and it infuriates me because our culture has been involved with these kinds of beings for hundreds of years. We have a lot of folklore stories, but we also have a bunch of accounts based on true encounters. If you read up on supernatural beings in native Alaska, there are some horrific ones that will straight up scare the shit to you. This happened a long time ago, and I do think of it time and time again. Like why? Why did it do that to me, of all people? I always heard stories of my friends running into little people, and I never did saw them before. I would just be like man. I wish I can run into a little person or something. Or something I recall saying that a bunch of times... It's possible that one of their supernatural powers could sense this. Like almost mocking me, this is what you wanted to see, huh? I wouldn't go out to places at night unless I had a ride because who knows what it would do if I saw it again. This went on for about a year, then I kind of just forgot about it, I guess. Nowadays I can walk alone at night and be much less worrisome. I've done it countless times since then. And if it wanted to do something to me, it damn sure would by now. People tell me that they choose who can see them and who can't. Their stealth is unmatched, and only a select few can see the big and little people. That's why I wonder why me. Why did it choose to do that to me? Was it just to quench my thirst for the supernatural, telling me this shit is real? I'll never know. I'm certainly not going to ask it. This is one of my desert stories. They are all true with the given disclaimer that I'm only human and have made mistakes in perception and judgment the same as the rest of us. I don't drink booze to more than a light buzz most of the time and have only blacked out one says early in my teens. I don't really me as with weed and avoid hallucinogens. Deserts are inherently kinda otherworldly places, even if you call one home. Dens in particular are very odd. I know of only a few places where you can find them in my part of the world. The northernmost are the Kilpecker Dunes in the Red Desert of southern Wyoming, then to the south, Great Sand Dunes National Park in Colorado, and further south yet are the Dunes in White Sands National Park. Maybe there are others, but these are the ones I've been to many times. They are some of the few places where I feel reasonably comfortable practicing firecraft in dry seasons. They are an amazing place to learn about what you can and can't do without, and to practice more esoteric bushcraft and survival skills. These three locations are also by amazing coincidence where these stories take place. I'll start here with the one I've been to the most. I grew up in a high desert. They are unforgiving by their very nature, but if you can take what they throw at you, they are full of a surprising amount of life and beauty. The forests and mountains may be my sanctuary, but I fear in my heart that I am ultimately a desert creature, and the dry wind that steals away warmth and moisture also calls me home. I love the desert and the winds that allow nothing spare. I love the rocky creek beds where the bones of the fish that once gave them life blew them into dust centuries ago. I love the rocky outcrops rotted away to globular non, forms by wind and ice. The desert is my home. Much like any other home, once you get used to its little tales, a sense of a place forms within you. You know when you're alone in it, when a cherished knick-knack has been moved a four left open. Sometimes the echoes of a missing familiar sound can whisper a warning, a slight sense of offness. Sometimes, though, they can scream. 
The dunes of the Red Desert are not easy to get to, and depending on which part you're in, entry can be of dubious legality. I, of course, of course, would never advise going where you aren't allowed, and certainly never have in my hastier, less cautious youth. No, sir. I'd been many times, and I tried to avoid camping or tooling around out there in the same spot. Alcohol was usually hauled out, water always was, and usually some lightweight means of defending oneself. But there isn't exactly a plethora of prey animals to feed a huge predatory population, so it's not really all that necessary. Somewhere around a decade ago, maybe more, maybe less, I took something of an on-again, off-again girlfriend of mine, off-again girlfriend of mine out to the Red Dunes, hopefully for a, a night of fun, if not outright debauchery. The pretense, which she later happily confirmed was pretense for her as well, was that we were there to practice air-based water collecting techniques and firecraft. I've never been much of a smooth talker, but what can I say? Hope springs eternal. I won't use any real names, but I'll refer to her by the trade I most associate with her. So let's call her Grace. It was a drive and a half, but eventually we got there and in relative comfort. Like many young women in the Mountain West, parental worries of their daughters being stranded somewhere by buying them overbuilt sport utility vehicles is with all-wheel drive and enough creature comforts to make you feel like you never left home at all. As they have the gas efficiency of a derrick fire, and Grace was nothing if not practical, she had yanked out half the seats and turned the inside into huge cargo space including a secondary gas tank. I understand that this is not necessarily safe if done by an amateur and is typically outside of the cab in a truck bed, but whatever. Not my vehicle. Anyway, this was good, as we burned a lot of gas to get out there and the all-wheel drive was very handy. We got there around the hottest part of the day, which in the early fall isn't so bad, and hiked out to where we wanted to set up camp. I had on occasion read about then before and decided to attempt a travel with a couple of poles I had brought for the purpose. For the time expenditure of around 20 minutes of setup, in the purpose of dragging crap along the sand, I gotta say, not bad. I was able to haul off. Of out BS out by myself around three, three and a half miles from where we parked. The dunes cover a truly huge space, and my favorite parts are, of course, the hardest to get to, as they tend to be the farthest from the adverse. I don't have an issue with them necessarily, but I like the dunes best when it's quiet enough to hear them sing. I don't understand it well enough to explain it. You'll have to look it up. They are what are known as living dunes, and they make a noise folks call singing. Of course, as a younger man trying, in a self-awarely stupid fashion, to impress my date with my muscles and trying to maintain a lively conversation without revealing how winded I was, don't judge walking on shifting sands is hard. I wasn't listening for the singing of sand, but trying to catch what Grace was saying over the wind. This story isn't about that part anyway, but I can say even with something of a bittersweet taste in my mouth now, that it was a pleasant time with a person I once loved, and I wouldn't have traded it for the world. We set up our camp in the nook between a few dunes, erecting a virginal handmade tent of Grace's design and manufacture with some difficulty and good-natured swearing. It was pretty cool, a came of low wedge designed to be erected in high wind zones and remain warm. It had a dead airspace built in, which was a pretty neat feature to my mind. Along with it, we discovered why a Dakota fire pit doesn't work well on shifting sands, which should have been obvious if either of us thought about it for more than a half second and thoroughly chastised by the cruel dictates of basic physics, dug a regular fire pit like folks with functioning frontal lobes. We set up a few frames which held elevated tarps with stones in the middle over half-buried buckets to attempt to collect dew as well. I showed her the basics and Grace lit her first friction fire with a willow bough drill, a cottonwood baseboard, and yucca stalk spindle. 
This is my go-to combo in the Western Steppe, by the way, in only a few tries. As the pre-dusk light show that descends every evening, known to the natives as Golden Hour. Probably to everybody, for all I know, rolled across the dens and mountains of the Red Desert like so much maple syrup over harsh and unusually topographically variable pancakes, Grace and I were letting some stew cook over the fire while I showed her how to process yucca for fiber. We had a very pleasant evening characterized by not enough stew and too much whiskey in a song I wrote. Very much not for her, except in the fact that it very much was, accompanied by one of those horrible little broom-shaped traveling guitars. As is the way of the fortunes of all young men trying to impress women who they should know, have them dead to rights already, the B-string broke halfway through. If you can't make the object of your affection swoon, making them laugh their asses off isn't a bad consolation prize. We ended the night wrapped in a blanket by the fire, watching the moon rise and the stars do their gentle revolving dance around Polaris until I carried her, snoring like Ban saw, into her sleeping bag. I settled into mine and let the sound of the wind and the singing dunes carry me to sleep. As an aside, folks who might still benefit from this advice, take time to remind yourself to remember moments like these as they happen. They are gifts, and they should be treasured as such. I rested comfortably for a while, maybe an hour or two, before the whiskey reminded me of the debt I now owed it, and I went to relieve myself. I was immediately taken aback by two things. One was the ludicrous brightness of the moon, despite the residing in the red. Desert, the Kilpecker dunes, are in fact a kind of creamy tan color, and on nights with a full moon, you might find darker conditions under a storm cloud in the middle of the day. The light seemed like it was pulsing a little, which I assume was probably more to do with dehydration and booze than the actual light sources. The second thing I noticed was the calm. It's almost always windy in Wyoming. It just is. I grew up there, walking to school in steady 40 miles per hour winds. Calm does happen, but it's usually a relative calm, like only eight miles per hour winds. This was still. Waking up to the calm is like waking up in a strange room you don't remember falling asleep in. Not inherently bad, per se, but disquieting and alien in a small but pervasive way. I climbed up a nearby dune because if I have to urinate, I may as well do so from a great height. The men reading this will understand. And because I wanted a good view of the surrounding area under its unusually well-illuminated condition, the only sound was my footsteps, my breath, and the gentle hum of the dunes themselves. Not even an owl to be heard. As I got to the top, a mountain came into view. Actually, several did. This isn't an unusual experience in the Rockies, as visibility can often be hundreds of miles in clear conditions and farther from elevation. What was of note was that above the ones to the north of me, there were flashes and flickers of light. Thunderstorm up north was my first thought, which would have been the safe bet, but I saw no clouds past them. I then noticed the ghostly colors of the lights and realized I was watching the aurora borealis, which I was hitherto unaware could be seen from that far south. I took a moment to relax and enjoy it before scanning around me to see what other sights the moon would show me. It was then that I spotted, down below me in a flatter area, what appeared to be many numerous four-legged creatures, cows, sheep, antelope, hell, even deer or elk wouldn't be that strange. I honestly couldn't tell you what they were, only that where were probably more than twenty and less than fifty. More about that in a moment, but in the middle, I swore I saw an old school, I kid you not, covered wagon. Not the pioneer kind, but the blockier, fully roofed shepherd's hut on wheels that dotted Wyoming like freckles. A hundred and twenty years ago, folks think it was the cattle that built the West, but Wyoming, first and foremost, was built on sheep. 
However, whatever I was seeing, it was all backlit by the moon, so they were casting shadows from the side facing me. Now, I'll be honest with y'all, I, I don't have the absolutely clearest vision. It's not bad, better with glasses, but I don't usually bring them with me to throw a leak in the middle of the night. So when I say the movement of these critters in the wagon look strange, almost flickery, I expect you to take it with a grain of salt. I expect you to say it had something to do with the aurora or my eyes being tired, and those are all legit. Thankfully, I have really good hearing and olfactory perception. What my mediocre vision doesn't explain is why I was looking at something probably less than a mile away, and I couldn't hear it on a still night. Wagons are noisy. They creak worse than boats, even when new. Livestock are noisy, and I'd find it odd to see a group that size with no bells around their necks. Nothing. Silence. Furthermore, why would you try to travel by night? It was bright, sure, but it's not like that's a common practice, at least not according to anything I've ever heard. You want your critters together and easily defended from predators. That's what I understand. I watched them for a while, moving slowly across the ground almost like they were underwater. Slow enough I broke off a yucca stock and stuck it into the ground to mark the progress. Slow, but it was there. I stayed up there watching the lights and the procession of shadows for a long time. Eventually I decided to whistle at them. The two fingers in the mouth, super loud angry dad, whistled. I heard it echo back at me and then nothing. I yelled a loud hello at them as well, echo and nothing again, huh? No change in pace, no lights. I started to think the progress might be the moon moving across the sky and not whatever I thought it was. So I decided to go grab my binoculars and try to wake up Grace to at least see the lights. It was a little treacherous descending, but I made it in one piece. Camp was as I had left it, and I relaxed a little. I opened the tent flap and dug around a little. Found my knocks but my etmeps to rouse my lady friend were unsuccessful. She was not having it. Not at all. She rolled over and went back to sleep and chastised. I went back up to the top of the dune. It took me a little longer this time. I was definitely feeling the climb by the time I got to the crest again. It looked like a little progress had been made, according to my yucca stalk markers. Curious as hell, I decided to use the binoculars to try to make out what I was looking at. I couldn't find the shadows in the binoculars. There are two possible influences on that. One being these were old binoculars, and they had been stuck in maximum zoom since I had gotten them. The other would be it was in the wee hours of the morning, and I had several hours earlier imbibed some booze. But try and try again. Nothing. I couldn't get eyes on the critters or the wagon. Couldn't hear them. Couldn't get a long-distance look at them. What was I to do? I said of it and went back to bed. Whatever I was looking at wasn't hurting me. It was just curious, and I had grown drowsy and cold, lying on the cold sand. I narked the direction with one of the stalk segments, slid down the dune on my ass, and crawled back into the tent. As I lay there, waiting for sleep in the warm and dark, I heard that gentle dune noise again, and the wind picked back up. My lullaby... Just as I was drifting off, though, I thought I heard a whistle echo across the sands, but from very far away. I put it in to my ears, playing tricks on me, and when I next opened my eyes, it was morning. Problem was, I was sitting next to the still crackling fire, not in the tent, and Grace was leaning against me as we sat wrapped in a blanket. I know, I know. If you, this was just a dream, you dee. I can hear you just fine. There are a few problems with that hypothesis, though. One was I put out the fire before going to bed. I'm camping in a giant ashtray with a shovel in hand. It was effortless to put out, and I remembered doing so very clearly. Another was that I was wearing shoes, which I hadn't done to go relieve myself, and I hadn't done since we started the fire the night before, since I wanted a better grip on my baseboard to show Grace how to light a fire with a stick and bow. 
I have monkey feet judge away. Here's another. I can see my footsteps up the den and the trail from my impromptu derriere. Sledding session. Okay. I woke Grace up, and she said that she thought we had slept in the tent. I concurred, and we sat there blearily blinking at a fire we didn't remember building. I asked her to start the coffee and climb back up the den, this time with my compass and my binocular. My yucca fragments were there, and I got a heading, scoping out where I thought they were the night before. Still didn't see anything that would have made sense. So I headed back down once more on the Achik Express and talked to my girlfriend about what I had seen. She wasn't particularly freaked out by any of it, confidently told me I was still asleep or sleepwalking when I saw lights in the bizarre caravan. She was a little concerned by the lost time and not remembering getting up, but I, I think to her credit as a reasonable person, she thought I was winding her up. I wasn't offended. I was, however, racked by curiosity. What the hell had happened? I'm not a sleepwalker as far as I know, and I as I am now writing this have lost time before out in the wilderness, but never before this incident. Was it just weird shadows? Had I been asleep? My markers were there, so I had been pretty lucid for someone. One simple test I thought of would confirm or deny it, I decided to throw on my boots and hike over to where I thought the trail should be by my best guess, while I let Grace do her morning routines. A short, brisk walk later, and I found nothing. No prints of any kind. This part wasn't as sandy as some others, so prints wouldn't have been everywhere, but there were none. Likelihood of sleep and booze-fueled hallucinations increasing. I did a fairly thorough purge of a few hundred yards in several directions, leaving my water bottle as a guide for where I thought it should be. No prints. I didn't give up. I trust my senses most of the time, and I'm stubborn. Also, I wasn't seeing anything that, given the angle of the moon, should have cast a shadow like that. Scrub. Low brush. No trees, no boulders. I kept looking first along the route I thought they would have cone from. No prints again. Something to catch my eye, though. In a less sandy patch, I saw a long stretch of depressed clay. A rut, I realized, and some mild depressions in the rock here and there. A rut from a wheel made of something harder than modern tires with a less gentle suspension. Now that I was looking for it, I saw more here and there. Headed to bisect the dunes from one grassland to the next. Just an old, old trail from long ago. I don't know what any of that was. I wasn't of sober or clear mind, although I was far from... Blackout drunk or sleep deprived, Grace got angry at me after a certain point of talking about it, so I stopped bringing it up. We finished out our outing. Our water collectors were successful in that they collected dew and unsuccessful in that it was about a cup and a half from the three of them together. We made a bolo out of some rocks and yucca cordage pre-made its uh, process and what we had made while we were there was minimal and strictly as a tutorial. We practiced at ladle skills. Ruined some perfectly good flint in the attempt to make a pair of blades. We shared many good meals together. Still overall a very pleasant trip. After another couple of uneventful nights we headed home. I hadn't discussed it with anyone since really. I have no good explanation. I have, however, been out there again, and while I've never seen anything like that again, twice in my recollection, I whistled at the top of the dunes before going to bed and later that night, I was sure I heard one back. Probably just another camper. Probably. I remember the day we received the call. My name is Alex, a seasoned police officer, and together with National Guard Sergeant Ramirez, we were chosen to lead a team of skilled officers and soldiers into a remote forest. Our mission was simple capture or kill the dangerous predator that had been terrorizing hikers and campers. Little did we know the horror that awaited us. As we ventured deeper into the woods, a sense of unease settled over our group. 
We soon realized that we were not only facing a cunning and lethal adversary, but also an unknown entity that seemed to be manipulating the environment against us. Trees swayed menacingly, shadows danced in our peripheral vision, and chilling whispers filled the air. We knew we were dealing with something far beyond our understanding. Our team encountered a series of terrifying incidents that revealed the predator's true nature, a supernatural being born from the shadows of the forest, feeding off the fear of its victims. As our group's ranks were picked off one by one, Ramirez and I began to understand the Predator's sinister game. It was not only hunting us, but also luring us deeper into the woods, where an ancient evil awaited. We knew we had to act fast. Rallying our remaining forces, Ramirez and I led our team further into the heart of darkness, determined to confront the unknown Predator and put an end to its reign of terror. But as we pressed on, the haunting memories of our past traumas threatened to overwhelm us, and we knew we had to face our own fears if we were to survive this deadly game. As the final confrontation approached, we uncovered the dark truth behind the creature's origins and its connection to the land. This supernatural predator was a harbinger of a much greater ancient evil, one that had been awakened by the creature's presence. We knew we had to face this abomination, even if it meant risking everything. Our team fought with every ounce of courage and determination we could muster, battling not only the Predator, but also the primal force that had been unleashed upon the world. Amidst the chaos and destruction, Ramirez and I found strength in each other, pushing ourselves beyond our limits to protect our team and ensure the survival of countless innocent lives. In the end, we emerged victorious, vanquishing the ancient evil and sending the Predator back into the shadows from whence it came. Our mission was complete, but the scars we bore would serve as a constant reminder of the horrors we had faced. As we returned to our daily lives, Ramirez and I vowed to never forget the lessons we had learned in that remote forest. We knew we had faced the unthinkable and had emerged stronger for it. And though the world may never know the full extent of our battle, we took solace in the knowledge that we had confronted the darkness and lived to tell the tale. My name is Gabriel Santos Cabral. I am 20 years old now and my encounter happened when I was 6 years old, turning 7. Back then, my family and I lived in a country stead in Wondrina, Parana, Brazil. It wasn't a rural property, it was more like a country summer house, but in the city. The property was just outside the suburbs, in the northwestern part of the city, edging the city limits and nearing the country. It was an approximately 420 square meters, 502 square yards piece of land, surrounded by 2 meters, 6 5 feet walls, for more privacy. The house sat in a far corner of the property, with a good view of the surroundings 90-95% view of the whole property from the front porch of the house. The region, northern Parana, where the city lies, resembles southern Missouri or northeastern Kansas, but it's tropical, rather than temperate subtropical. The city is a metropolitan area, with a population of 486.000 plus people. It would resemble Wichita, Kansas, or Kansas City, Minnesota. The landscape is fairly flat, with some hills. The scenery is little vegetation, with only some parks and nature preserves, none big enough to have a decent population of any medium, large animal species, whatsoever. There are no bears in Brazil, and the largest predators found in the wild are the main wolf, the southern South American cougar, and the pantanal jaguar, none of which, really, could be identified as what I saw. My encounter was brief, but it was clear enough for me to make out the shape of the creature, its color, size, etc. So, onto the encounter. It was Friday, October 18, 2002. It was mid-spring in the South Hemisphere, and that night, there was a full moon with relatively cloudy skies. We had a dozen dogs on the property, which all slipped together in a large kennel on the side of the house. They would be pretty quiet at night, but on that night, they were unsettled and spooked. One of the dogs managed to escape from the kennel and was desperately trying to get into the house. I was alone with my mom, and she asked me to turn on the floodlights outside the house and check out what all of the what the commotion was about. 
I did that and went to the front porch to scan the area, trying to see what could have scared the dogs. Staring at the corner, where we had a mango tree 90, 120 meters, 98, 130 yards away, I saw this large, grayish creature running on all fours, avoiding the lights. It passed behind the mango tree and disappeared in the dark. As I saw it, I immediately identified it as being a werewolf, like that from the movie Bad Moon 1996, but with a slightly larger head, thicker snout, and bulkier build. On its hind legs, it must have stood, at the very least, as tall as the property walls 2 meters, or 6 5 feet, I stand 1 74 meter, or 5 7 feet, by the way. I froze for a few seconds after seeing it. It was a brief sighting. It lasted 2 minus 3 seconds. And as soon as I recovered from the shock, I sprinted as fast as I could back into the house, locked all of the doors, and closed the windows that were still open. I was familiarized with werewolf movies back then. I was already aware of the impossibility of there being someone who could shapeshift into a monster, but what I saw was unmistakably similar to a werewolf. So, since that encounter, I started to believe in werewolves only under the same concept of dogmen which are natural, rather than supernatural, and look the way they do 24-7, a term which I only came across recently. And, that is the encounter I had with a dogman. Just like in the U.S., where there are places where sightings are frequent, there are places in Brazil where they happen frequently too. In the U.S., it would be Elkhorn, Taylor, and Marshall, Texas. In Brazil, it would be Jonopolis and Tres Lagoas. Jonopolis has had sightings of werewolves, dogmen ever since its foundation. Its first mayor was said to be a werewolf, back in the mid-late 1,800 seconds. The town is filled with werewolf references. Tres Lagoas has had many sightings, ever since the late 1980s divided by early 1990s. There was a series of nights in this small city in the 1990s where people claimed that a werewolf was roaming the streets. At night, after dark, trying to invade houses, climbing on roofs and howling all night long, scaring people's dogs and attacking livestock. It really scared people. The state police began reinforcing night patrols and started investigating, assuming that someone was out at night in a suit, scaring people. Some cryptozoologists even collected DNA samples. As it turned out, it wasn't human DNA or that of any known animal. And it certainly wasn't artificial hair from a suit. So to begin, this story happened back in 2018. I arrived in this small, rural town near Cape May. The company I was working for at the time was sending me out to go door to door, advertising cable and Wi-Fi that they wanted me to sell. I was getting weird vibes all throughout the day as the town itself was very small and a bit creepy, with people staring at me or giving me the cold shoulder for the entire day. It seemed like a lot of the townsfolk that I encountered that day were on edge, and it was a weird tense atmosphere that I shrugged off, as people are weird all the time. I continued doing my job, chugging a Red Bull to keep me going, which didn't affect me at all surprisingly. Besides the weird atmosphere, the scenery was actually quite pretty once you got off of the main road. I had to stop at different streets, and some were in the woods on long and seemingly beautiful endless roads. It was quite scenic. Just before sunset, I was scheduled to visit a few houses on a small peninsula. To get to this peninsula you had to go down a very long road, past the summer camp area, past a trailer park, past the woods, and then you finally find yourself in a small open area with a bay marsh, a couple small expensive houses, and sure access. The houses were so close to the water it seemed to be a code violation, but I'm sure they were built to withstand storms since they looked so expensive. Every house had its own theme and the area was mostly deserted. Only one house had someone inside, whom I had talked to after knocking on his door. I was so distracted looking at the houses and scenery that I didn't notice how fast sunset was approaching. I came to the realization that I should start heading back to avoid being alone on that long deserted pathway in the woods. 
As a smaller female, I'm never comfortable after dark in isolated places, especially without self-service. I was making my way down the path, so far so good, as it wasn't completely dark yet. As I approached the wooded area of the road, I was walking a bit faster, since there were no street lights and the sunlight was rapidly disappearing. As I walked at a decently fast pace, I noticed something. The woods were eerily quiet. All the life that I was hearing before was gone. No crickets, no birds, just pure silence. I stopped in my tracks and got chills down my spine as I felt the feeling that I was being watched. I looked around the dark woods for any sudden movements and then, like clockwork, something up ahead made its way out of the tree line. It looked to be some type of large animal. My brain went into overdrive analyzing whatever this animal was. Was it a bear? A dog? No. It looked like a large dog. But dogs don't get this big. Though I was intimidated by its large size, whatever it was hadn't noticed me. Even though I was scared, I also didn't want to walk back and go into that one man's house. As a woman, I would rather take my chances with a wild animal than be alone with a man I don't know in a deserted holiday neighborhood. Suddenly, as I was thinking this, the large animal in the distance had finally noticed my presence. It was observing me, not entirely sure of what to do with me. There wasn't enough light anymore for me to see the animal's face, but I felt unusually frightened. Whatever I was looking at was definitely too big to be a black bear, with a shoulder height of at least five feet on all fours, which is comparable in size to a brown bear. The mass on this creature was extensive, as the outline of what I could see looked like a wolf on steroids. It was very muscular. I also noticed that the outline of its face was very similar to that of a German shepherd or a wolf, as it had perked ears and a long snap. In the heat of the moment, I could only hear the sound of my heart palpitating as fear and adrenaline started to crawl its way into my bloodstream. It felt as if time stood still, and then it dawned on me. What I was looking at wasn't a normal animal, and it was simply too big to be any animal that I could recognize from New Jersey's catalog of fauna. And, if it wanted to attack me, I would be powerless against it. It was simply too big. Though, to calm myself down, I threw the idea that this creature was out of the ordinary out because I felt like this could be rationalized somehow. I made my brain go back to the idea of this being maybe being a large dog or coyote. I also did not believe in cryptids, and was completely unaware of what size coyotes are supposed to be, so I made a quick decision. Realizing that this could very well be a life or death situation, I came to the conclusion that this very large dog-like creature was probably a skittish coyote that I could scare off, at least temporarily, to calm down my nerves. What other choice did I have? The longer I kept standing there, the more aggressive I might come across to this animal, and I didn't want it to get territorial or get the idea that I was easy prey. So, I decided I would make the most hideous, loud, confusing, and startling scream. How I could muster and just sprint the rest of the way. After I screeched this hideous sound out of my body as hard as I could. The animal quickly changed its body language to defensive, but then it quickly changed its mind to deciding I wasn't worth a fight as it ran a decent distance into the woods, not too far though. I decided to sprint as fast as I could pass that area, and beyond. I sprinted until I reached the end of the road, and noticed there was a summer camp area with street lights near me. I rested on top of the table there, out of breath and feeling my heart pound out of my chest. However, I was still very shaken up and still felt like I was being watched. I kept my eyes on the tree line. My eyes were darting around, looking for any sign this animal was still there. Once I felt like the coast was clear, I located the next house I was scheduled to visit, and I quickly made my way over. I met a nice family who ended up buying cable from me, and I told them what had happened to me that night and how I was treated by the locals. The lady of the family, who I presumed to be the mother, said I don't know why they sent you out here alone. These woods are dangerous after dark, and there are creepy people who live around here. The impression she was giving me was that there were animal encounters she couldn't explain, and that there were lots of ex-convicts in the area, and people who should have been arrested but haven't been. 
She was equally concerned about the people as she was the animals around this place. This gave me goosebumps. How many times today could my life have been taken? They were extremely concerned for my safety and told me to contact my team leader so I could get picked up. They said they didn't want me to go outside again and that I should call it quits for the night and not make it to any other houses. Till this day and I still have no idea what creature I had encountered. There are strange things in the woods, things people don't speak about or cover up. I felt like the townsfolk of that town knew something about what I encountered. So, weird creature I encountered in those woods, let's never meet again. So I was packed in the Gila wilderness a few miles on a solo elk hunt. This was an area that you had to pack water in so it was not a friendly place. On the eleventh day of the hunt I was approaching my sawtooth tippy at the end of the day and right before dark. As I neared the tippy I noticed that it looked like the door was opened up. My first thought was that a bear ripped it open because there are plenty of them in this area. The hair on my neck immediately stood up. I had no side arm so I grabbed an arrow out of my quiver and continued towards my tippy. To my surprise the door was not ripped open but just unzipped. I was thinking WTF. So now I am about 20 feet from the tippy and the evening light had about 5 to 10 minutes left until dark. As I am looking into the tippy I see movement. Then some person sits up inside. Again I was like WTF. At that point I yelled to the F are you and WTF are you doing in my tippy and WTF are you doing in my sleeping bag. He replies I wasn't in your bag I was just laying down on top. I got lost and I thought the owner left it out here and went to town. So he starts to come out of the tippy and as he did I was pointing my arrow at him. I said put your hands where I can see them which he did. This guy looked wicked crazy, long scraggy black hair, big yellow teeth and blood all over his clothes. He was also muttering over and over I didn't do what they said I did. Well just kidding, he looked like a six feet tall 55 year old balding white guy wearing glasses, dressed in street clothes, sneakers, no backpack, no jacket, no gear at all. He said he was with his friends who had killed an elk earlier that day and he got separated. I fired off a few questions trying to make heads or tails of his story, but it went in a couple directions and didn't make much sense. Something was not right. As I was questioning him he just started walking away, I'm like hey you can't go without a light, I have a spare light and you can just put it at the junction of the main road and I'll find it but the dude just kept walking away. Now this place is a rocky SOB and the nights at the time were super dark until about 2 a.m. A person would not do well trying to walk around without a light. So the dude started walking away and wouldn't take any help. At that point I thought oh shit check your gear. I quickly go in the tippy and notice that all my stuff had been moved from where I had placed them and then I see that my dinner water was gone and the effort wasn't on top of my sleeping bag he was in the darn thing. I ran out of the tippy and shouted some things towards his direction. I was basically out of water and not happy about him drinking my last water for dinner. I know he probably needed it but I needed it as well. I had just covered a bunch of miles that day plus I had been out there busting my ass for 11 days. To wrap this story up, I cleaned my gear the best I could because just the thought of someone in my bag bothered me very much. I had some wet wipes and paper towels but even after that I still felt violated. Now this guy was out there in the darkness and probably wasn't very far away so I left my light on inside the tippy then sat about 20 yards away just watching and listening for about an hour in case he came back. I didn't get much rest that night. Never figuring out what happened on this day has always bugged me. When I was about 10 years old my younger brother, a friend the same age as me, and I were riding our bikes from my friend's house back to mine. This happened in Florida in the winter time. It was about 8 a.m. in the morning. The temperature was about 4 degrees Fahrenheit, which is on the cold side for Florida. Mine and my friend's houses were about 5 miles apart. The trip could be done on sidewalks along well-traveled roads, but there was a shortcut along a secluded dirt road that ran parallel to the railroad tracks. The distance among this park was about one mile, 
but it would save about one half mile off the total trip. For this section, there were lots of bushes along the tracks, and sometimes hobos would sleep in the bushes. Our parents warned us not to take this route because there had been cases where the hobos had tried to abduct and possibly succeeded children and sexually abused them. We always assumed that if the hobos tried that with us, we'd be able to get away. About halfway in the middle of this alternate route, which was the most secluded part of the trip, there was corn snake in a ceramic coffee mug in the middle of the dirt road. Being kids, naturally, we stopped to investigate. We poked the snake with a stick, and if it wasn't dead, it was a good actor. As if that wasn't strange enough, I picked up the coffee mug, which was filled to the brim with coffee and clearly had cream added to it, and the coffee was very hot. I got the creepiest feeling because I felt like we were being baited. I quietly told my brother and friend to get back on their bikes, and they didn't understand my sense of urgency. I held the coffee mug at the ready, and once they were on their bikes, I threw it into the bushes and told my brother and friend to book it, which they did. We never saw anyone, and to this day, I still do not know how someone could have gotten hot coffee into such a secluded area. The hobos were known to make fires, but we did not see or smell one, and on a cold day like that, you can usually smell a fire from a good distance. Seriously, knowing what I've told you, what's the most plausible explanation for what we saw that morning? Anyway, about three nights ago, I saw something that I still can't fully understand or explain. First, a little background. I live in mid-Michigan in a small residential slash suburban town surrounded by cornfields, you know the type. However, I do live in the more populated area as my parents' house, where I currently reside, is located within walking distance of our downtown. Our street is by no means desolate, dark or isolated, and most of the houses are fairly close to one another. A pretty urban setting given the town itself. Okay, back to the other night. It was about 2.30 a.m. and since it's pretty normal for me to be up that late, me and my dog have developed what I call our little routine. He comes to my door, lets out a huff to inform me that he's there, and then we go downstairs where I let him outside through the front door to go to the bathroom. After completing his business, he comes in and we share a share a midnight snack of ham straight from the fridge law. Now keep in mind, my dog is extremely well trained and very old. He doesn't need a leash or a fence to keep him from running away. He always comes right back after he's done. He'll even wait at the door if you aren't there. So on this particular night, I open the door for him and I'm just about to turn and walk away so I can prepare our midnight snack when I notice he's still standing on the porch staring across the street. This isn't completely out of the norm for him, but this was lasting a bit longer than usual. When he finally jumps off the porch, I follow his line of sight where he had been staring, and I see what looks like a large dog or maybe even a wolf slinking across my neighbor's yard on the other side of the street. For the first few seconds, I'm trying to figure out WTF this thing is, because it looks like it could be a dog, but something isn't right. It's too long, and the way it's moving isn't normal. And even though it was only about 50 feet away, it looked as though it were blurry. I can't think of any other way to describe it. None of it made sense. At this point I go into panic mode because so far this creature hasn't seemed to notice me or my dog, but if it does, my dog doesn't stand a chance. Like I said, he's old. And also a Pomeranian. Whatever this thing was, it would destroy him, no doubt. I decide to slowly open the outer glass door, hoping to create just enough noise to alert my dog that it's time to come in, but not enough for whatever that thing is to hear me too. Luckily, my dog notices right away, and starts running back towards me. But at the same time, this dog creature starts turning toward me, slowly. It almost felt fake how unnatural it moved, like animatronics or something. I'm not even sure what I'm looking at. But I have this indescribable feeling that I'm not supposed to be seeing this. So, as this thing is turning to look at me, my dog is coming through the door simultaneously. And for about one second, I take my eyes of the creature thing to look down at my dog and close the door. When I look back up, 
This thing has moved about 30 feet to the left into my neighbor's driveway rather than their yard, and is standing on its hind legs at around 7-8 feet tall, staring at me. Now I'm really freaking out. How did it move so quickly, and how did it not make a single sound? How is it so tall? I literally looked away for maybe a second. I look away again to lock the door and gather myself, only to look again and see absolutely nothing. It was gone. This whole ordeal only lasted maybe 20-30 seconds total. Shaking, I give my dog his ham and mine, and I run downstairs to my brother's room in the basement to tell him what happened. Being a normal 19-year-old playing video games, his response was, Why the BTF that's super weird? But honestly, I just needed to tell someone to confirm that what just happened actually happened, and that I wouldn't wake up the next day and convince myself it was a dream. Over the last few days, I've told anyone who would listen about what I saw, including my parents. Those who are closer to me seemed a bit more unnerved, because like I mentioned earlier, I don't usually believe in this type of thing. They could tell I was shaken by whatever it was that I saw. Tonight, after some random googling as the result of my restless mind, I came across what appears to be the exact description of what I saw. The dogman, which eventually led me to this threat. I've never heard anything about it before, but I am now fully convinced I saw one in front of my very own eyes, and it saw me too. This happened back between 2009 to 2011. The people in the story are myself, my ex-girlfriend who I will call Penny, and a friend who I will call Kyle. These aren't their real names, I don't feel comfortable sharing them online. My mother asked us to pick up her cat from the vet around 4 or 5 p.m. one night. As it was winter in the northern Midwest, it was getting dark at around this time, and it was already a bit of a drive to and back from the vet because my mother lived out in the country and the vet was in town. At any rate, we went and got the cat without issue, and after we were to drop it off, myself, Penny, and Kyle were going to go see a movie. We get back to my mother's house. The sun is already set for the most part, and it's quite cold. Kyle decided to help me carry the cat inside, while Penny kept the car running to keep the heater going. Kyle liked talking to my mother and wanted to see her before we headed back out to see the movie. Well, we're walking up to the house, and both Kyle and I stopped because we both got this weird feeling at the same time. We figured this out later when we were talking about it. The house is in front of us, and my mother's yard is behind us. It was a big farmhouse, so it had a sprawling front yard. We both stood still, we felt frozen to the spot by this weird feeling, and I looked first and saw something standing behind us, in the yard, and then Kyle looked too. The thing had to have been well over six feet three because that's how tall Kyle is and it was bigger than him. It had a hulking shape, with more mass on top than the bottom like a hunchback, which kind of just tapered off into shadows, so I don't know if it had legs or what they might have looked like. The whole thing was pitch black even in the dark. It had no eyes, no discernible features whatsoever as far as facial features go, but I could tell it was huge and very angry. There was just a feeling I was getting off of it that it was mad that we were there, and I could tell it was staring right at us. The only discernible features about it were it had horns, massive horns, like antlers, sticking up off its head, and the hunch in its back seemed to be lumpy and had a regular shake sticking out of it but because it was so dark I couldn't figure out what it was. Neither of us heard a sound from it. It just stood there and menaced us for what felt like minutes, but it can't have been that long. Kyle unfroze me from the spot, and the two of us darted into my mother's house and delivered her cat. We waited a bit, but after looking outside, didn't see anything out there anymore, and after talking to my mother for a bit, we ran back outside and Penny put on the gas, and we got out of there. We never saw it again after that. But to add a little background on my mother's house, it has always been haunted. The house that is standing there now is a newer build. The older farmhouse that had been there previously had burned down and killed a young boy, a mother, and her older daughter. My mother has had issues with it for a long time. She's had the house blessed on several occasions, but nothing ever sticks. 
Friends who stay in the house have reported weird stuff happening to them as well, and when I lived there I also experienced some odd things, but this was the only time this happened. The house is situated in Indiana, near the Sugarloaf Mound, which was used by the Miami natives in Indiana's prehistory. My nephew, an electrician in Portland, heard this on the job. Two electricians who'd gone on annual fall hunting trips with a group of fellow electricians for several years bowed out of one year's trip at the last minute and were reluctant to say why. This after they'd taken time off to hunt and bought tags. A year later they again declined to go on the annual hunting trip. One evening after work, one of them was drinking in a tavern when he was pressed as to why he and the other fellow no longer wanted to hunt with their buddies. Reluctantly, he told of the following encounter. These two fellows had gone up in the area to be hunted to do a little pre-trip scouting. After spending the afternoon cruising logging roads, they pulled over on a ridge to watch the sunset, smoke, and talk. They'd been there a while, sitting in the truck, smoking. It had gotten dark when they heard footsteps through the forest passing down one side of the truck, then crunching gravel as it circled out of the woods in front of the truck and stopped. They turned on the headlights to see a giant creature crouched down some distance in front of the truck facing them. It stood up and in a panic they started the truck, threw it in reverse, spun it around and very nearly backed over the embankment. The rear tires actually went over and they had to slam it into 4WD to pull it out. They fled. On the job the next day the other fellow, confronted with the story, confirmed it but wouldn't discuss it. I had separated from my elk hunting party on Green Ridge on the second morning of elk season. I left them a note to where I was going because the elk were thick in the wickiup area the previous year. We weren't seeing anything and I thought I would have better luck if I drove down there. I was driving on FSRD 700 and slowed down as the roads are somewhat narrow. The road tees at FSRD 900. I slowly proceeded to make a right turn and check for any other rigs that might be coming from the east. I seen then something walking down the middle of the road. I only ignored it for a split second. I stopped it, slapped my truck in reverse and backed up to the T in the road and took a second look. After over 25 years of hunting, I never had to question anything in the clear like this. I observed what I thought was someone out on a walk but noticed the stride the creature took was steady and calm. I looked for clothes, a rifle, hat, anything to question otherwise. Well, I seen none whatsoever. I also noticed the height was much taller than a human. It was very black. It was walking straight towards me. I estimated about 450 yards to ever take a few between me and it. I totally forgot about my rifle with me which is chambered with a oint 308 150 grams R load. With telescopic sights, I was mesmerized by what I was actually seeing. As it approached with a steady pace of closing distance, it started to make a turn to my left. The arms were long almost down to the knees. I could not make out the gender, but I did notice it was slightly slouched over. It straightened to full height and taking about two half from the center of the road, disappeared in the trees. No sounds were made. I had come to the conclusion without doubt I had just witnessed a Bigfoot in the wilderness. I had reason to believe the height was about eight, nine feet tall. Very broad shoulders. I am sorry, but I wasn't curious enough to go get a closer look for tracks, etc. I didn't want to take a chance on it turning on me as some have been known to do. Although in an area not too far from there, I hunted for a short while. Problem was, there was neither a hint of a bird, squirrel, or even a chipmunk. This is unusual in a hunting situation. I am thankful that in my case, my encounter was distant enough to go a different direction and he can go his. I haven't really gone down there since. This is my first official report of going on the record about this. Anyone who knows me well will tell you I am a very credible person and this is a subject I take seriously. There was a report on the news about one year earlier almost exactly of an encounter with another elk hunter near La Pine. Thanks for listening.
Hope to see you tomorrow, son.